¿Queda bien? ¿Así? You can hear me? Not very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks again to the organizers for this very nice uh, workshop. Yes, it's impossible, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Cecilia Ventura from Argentina. I'd love to, to chair this uh, session. Sorry for my sore throat. I hope you can understand me. Um, and it's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Aurora Hernández Machado from the Facultad de Física de la Universidad de Barcelona. Uh, she is a distinguished uh, professor, full professor of condensed matter physics uh, at the Facultad de Física in Barcelona, where she also did her studies. She has written more than 100 research papers and is the head of the group of dynamic interfaces in nanotechnology, fluidics, and biophysics. And uh, she's going to talk today, this morning, uh, on cells, hydrogels, and big vesicles in microchannels. And I leave you. Uh, uh, the floor to okay. Professor. Thank Charles. you. Thank you. Okay, well, first, thank you, Rafael, for the invitation. It's always very nice to be in Mexico, you know that. That is, I like the country very much. Okay, then today I will talk about a mixture of things that we are doing in our uh, lab and doing theory. I am a theoretician, but I am more and more interested to do a research based in experiment. And then I like very much to have experimentalists with me that uh, organize, that we tailor experiment and we try to explain and to <laughs> characterize mathematically what are the uh, important features of these experiments. Then for example, I will give you uh, introduction of the type of experiments that we are doing now in the lab. For example, here we study cells in microchannels. This is a microchannel. To have an idea, this has one millimeter of uh, width and a high of 200 microns. And here we have, uh, this is the microchannel that we see here in a big picture. And we have four deposits, and we throw liquid from here to here and from here to here. And in this side, we have cells. These are endothelial cells, rat endothelial cells, that we uh, uh, introduce in this other deposit a uh, angiogenic factor that promote vessel formation. When you have simply a medium, the cells doesn't grow. But when you produce this gradient of concentration between this side of the microchannel, this wall and this other wall, you start seeing the growth of cells. And we want to, to mathematically model this type of experiments, okay? What is the, the thing that interests us very much in this type of experiments. When you have cells in these microchannels, you, in, in our experiments, we introduce a hydrogel to mimic the extracellular matrix. And the role of extracellular matrix is the support of cells. The cells are growing in the extracellular matrix. I don't know if you see well. This, as in this case, is a hydrogel, we have too much light. Okay, and if you see here, this is in red. We are seeing an image in 3D. And okay. Much better. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then we have this uh, uh, hydrogel that mimics the extracellular matrix. And then the hydrogel, you have to think that is a polymer that cross links 
and create whole like a porous media. And we are very interested to study the properties of this porous media from a physical point of view. And uh, this is to characterize this porous media in which the cells are growing. And usually people characterize this porous media by a macroreometer. This means with a big amount of a material in a big macroreometer. And uh, one of our interests in, in this field is to do mic microreology, to study at the level of the uh, small micro channels that we have. And for example, to study the elasticity of this hydrogel when you produce a pressure inside it and see what is the properties of the elastic properties and the viscous properties of this micro, uh, uh, this uh, porous media. How we start to study this type of thing was to study blood. Blood is a much more simple process, it's a much more simple uh, system in which you have red blood cells. In, and the interesting aspect regarding the other uh, situation was that we are interested in the elastic property. And uh, red blood cells are the prototype of an elastic system. You see here a healthy red blood cell that has this shape. Uh, and uh, one important fact of, uh, of red blood cells is that when, for example, you have a disease, in this case, for example, with, with, we are studying the mechanical properties of malaria-infected red blood cells. The parasitum of malaria that is uh, when go inside the, the, the cell affects the rigidity of the cell uh, could be a way to detect the disease. For example, here you see this is a healthy red blood cell. This is a malaria red blood cell. And the properties, for example, this is a pipette. You are uh, make an aspiration of the cell. And then you see that the force that you have to do to uh, aspirate the, the, the membrane is much smaller because the red blood cell, when it's healthy, is more elastic. And then <laughs> from the point of view of the experiment, to have blood in a lab is much more simple than to have a, 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 a micro channel with endothelial cell. Endothelial cell die very easily. You have to uh, maintain alive, and this is a complicated business. We are starting to do this in the lab. We are interested in this aspect. In the case of blood, simply you put uh, 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 an effect that doesn't coagulate, an anticoagulant, and it's enough to have the cells more or less alive for four or five days. Then, for example, things that we have done in our lab to study red blood cells in microchannels, you see here the red blood cells in flow. And our uh, point here is that you have a microchannel, a red blood cell has six microns. And here you have the flow of one red blood cell in a microchannel of essentially 10 microns. And this effect makes the elasticity of the red blood cell very important because at these small scales, the membrane plays an important role. And another thing that we see here is that the shape of the red blood cell changes with the flow. When you increase the flow, when you increase the velocity of the red blood cell, the shape is changing, trying to reduce friction and trying to reduce viscosity, okay? In this other experiment, you have malaria-infected red blood cells in a microchannel that has some pillars that are very small. These pillars, the distance between pillars is two microns. And then you have red blood cells that has the parasitum that is larger than that. And when you flow red, uh, the, the liquid, you see that the parasitum cannot cross the pillar. And then you have the phenomenon of pitting in which the parasitum go away 
from the red blood cell, from the membrane, without affecting essentially the membrane and producing something like an effect of uh, do the, the, the malaria disease disappear in some way. It's a way to say that this is a way to, with this pitting effect, to uh, make the red blood cell healthy again. Other experiments that we are interested are microvesicles. Microvesicles are important, for example, in the Golgi apparatum. Some years ago, there was a Nobel Prize for people studying uh, Golgi apparatum. In the Golgi apparatum, you have a tube with a semi-spherical cascade, and then you have, it's like this, and you have uh, 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 this type of vesicle that in, have the garbage that the, 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 uh, the cell has, and then you have the pitting phenomena in which the vesicle detach from the membrane. This is also in the case of endocytosis and exocytosis. You have the membrane of the uh, of the cell that is a bilayer with lipids that has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail that uh, self-organized in a bilayer. And now you have the phenomenon in which a flat interface, it has a so-called uh, spontaneous curvature. If you want to have a curvature in the system, we will explain it mathematically, you create uh, this uh, 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 peeling, and at, at the end, the peels uh, uh, have pinching and go away freely. And in this case, the important effect is that you are changing topology. And this makes life very, very complicated from the mathematical point of view. Okay, these are the type of experiments that one can do in a lab of microfluidics. And uh, now the point is how we describe these experiments mathematically. And to do this uh, thing, we will study mathematical modeling, characterizing the dynamical shapes with an energy formula. Then for example, in this case, this is a red blood cell. When I go to a, a conference in a biology, and the biologists see this shape fluctuating, they think that this a real cell. It's a real red blood cell. But it's not. It's this mathematical model in images. Okay, this is a, a mathematical red blood cell. And for to do that, you have the so-called phase field uh, formally, in which you have an order parameter is like uh, uh, the formalis of Ginsburg-Landau, in which you have a uh, energy uh, energy that determines the shape of the cell. And this order parameter tells you if you are inside the vesicle outside the vesicle or the membrane, and the interfacial membrane is a very, has a very small scale. And then you have essentially, if you cross the membrane, you have a hyperbolic tangent, and this is the dynamic evolution of the other parameter with time that tells you that this is the free energy, this is the chemical potential, this is diffusion, there is a diffusion phenomena, and you have fluctuation due to temperature, and then you resolve this equation and you get this shape. Okay, then one of, for example, the first uh, studies that one can think as most simple because we want to increase complexity in our study is to study the red blood cell, but instead of studying it uh, in, in a statistical, a, 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 in a 
here we study the dynamic effect, how the red blood cell move in time. And for this, we have the equation that we have first without taking the fluctuations, the order parameter, you have the diffusion with the chemical potential, the derivative of free energy. And now we introduce the motion of the fluid that is uh, in the microchannel. Here we have the microchannel. The microchannel is the fluid that is plasma. This is like water, is moving with a velocity and the micro and, and the red blood cell that is this, uh, that has this shape is moving inside the fluid. Then to introduce this effect, you have here the velocity and the gradient of the other parameters tell you that this is where the membrane is. And now you have Navier-Stock equation or better say a Stokes equation uh, with, without the inertial term. This is the pressure that you are, the gradient of pressure that you are introducing in your system, the viscosity term. And this is the effect of the, uh, a membrane on the fluid, okay? The membrane is coupled to the fluid and all together give you, when you integrate this shape. In this case, you can integrate the model in the, in the method that you like. Here we propose a, we so-called a, a stream function formalis, in which the stream function is defined in this way, this is the stream function, this is the vorticity. What? This? No, but this affects, this, this couple, this tells you that is important in one and minus one. And the, 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 the effect is the gradient of the chemical potential. So, you can make many, in many ways, you can, there are other groups that put the Laplacian, uh, the, the, the delta in the other side. But you, you don't need, you can, it's, it's uh, uh, integration, integration by parts that you go from one place to the other, okay? And then you have the vorticity, the string function, you have now this equation for these uh, three uh, parameters, and then integrating this, you get, the uh, shape of the red blood cell in fluid flow. Then for what is useful to have this type of mathematical formalis? Here, for example, uh, we have defined now a measure, an analytical measure, a quantitative measure of the process. For example, in this case, you, ha you have the vorticity, we call it the average vorticity, and you see how the uh, shape of the cell is changing with time. And with this uh, quantity, we see that in time, the, si the system evolved, has metastable state, and finally evolved to a final uh, stationary state. This means that with this type of mathematical formalism, you can uh, detect a stationary state. And more than that, you can go uh, further to obtain non, non, a, a new state that has not been observed uh, previously. And this is uh, something that would, I mean, it's important to, to have this type of mathematical formally. Okay, then this is for red blood cell. And now the point is, uh, we have this experiment, as I told you before, we have, uh, we want to study endothelial cell. Uh, this is something that is now a hot topic. Everybody wants to do endothelial cells or cells that are not red blood cells. Now go beyond that, uh, cells that uh, migrate, uh, uh, that has, because people want to study tissues and uh, organ on a chip. And then you, ha you have to go further in this direction. Then in this work, we have a study the advancement of uh, 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 cells in a hydrogel. We see here the hydrogel that you, you saw in the, in, the, in the introduction. This is a hydrogel. 
This is fibrinogen. And for example, here we have uh, in, the, in, in, our, in, in this uh, part of the system, we have a gradient of concentration of an angiogenic factor. This is VEGF, and the fact, uh, you have uh, uh, two sides with a uh, gradient of angiogenic factor, and the hydrogel plays a role because now you have a disorder uh, in your system because the angiogenic factor also plays a role, um, the hydrogel also plays a role of local angiogenic factor. And then now you have a uh, evolution in a disorder media that is not simply a gradient of concentration. Then in this case, now we go to our uh, formalist. Now we have our phase field mathematical model. And now uh, you, you saw before that in the case of red blood cell, the red blood cell has a shape that is not spherical. This is telling you that surface tension is not playing a role. There, the energy that we were using was the bending energy that uh, gives you different shapes of red blood cells. And it's the energy that goes to have a surface that is bent. In this case, this is the, the model is different. Now you have the other parameter with your time, the Laplacian, and this free energy is the free energy that takes into account that the, uh, there is a cost in energy to create surface. And this term here tells you that the finger grow due to the presence of this angiogenic factor. And then for example, when you have a, 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 a hole in all the, the system, you see that the, the final evolution is in this hole, in this uh, disorder media, the finger has grown to this. And you can study also the process from the very beginning. You start with a reservoir of cell. Here you have the gradient of concentration of angiogenic factor. You start with a pool of cells and you see that with time they grow until arrive to the end. In this model, no, is it, written here, okay? Here you have the angiogenesis, it's the same process as before, but now you have this uh, hydrogel, this extracellular matrix, we call it here, that is degraded. And in fact, in the experiment, it's like this. I mean, the, in fact, the cell degradate the extracellular matrix, probably chemically, but probably also uh, with uh, because the, the the hydrogel is elastic, but the the problem is complicated. And here we have a a, a model in which you have that you don't need now to have a hole from the very beginning. The uh, the 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 finger is growing because it is eating the uh, the hydrogel with time. Why is important this type of mathematical model? The idea is that you can do in silico prediction of the dynamics of this system. In fact, when we talk with our experimentalist group, they say, okay, probably in the future, we will only do mathematics because this model here is exactly the same as the uh, patterning that you have in the experiment. We have made copy of the hydrogel with the holes exactly in the same places that we have in the, in the mathematical model. And then you can mimic the real situation with this mathematical equation and this formally. Okay, okay, then uh, we want to go more and more 
in this direction, we have now cells that uh, uh, grow in hydrogel. We have red blood cells that could vascularize the system. And now here we have the so-called organ on a chip uh, experiment. Uh, this is a work that is part of a, a project that is the Lakaisha is a bank. And finally, the banks do things that <laughs> are okay for us. It's a Lakaisha Research Health. We have money to study organ on a chip to uh, study malaria. And then uh, usually when you study malaria, uh, you have rats that you humanize. And then, uh, for example, you put cells of humans and you study the malaria, how it uh, affects the, the rat. And then our experimentalist group is very happy to have uh, a system in which you don't have rats, but you have a microchannel. And then in this case, the thing that we do is you have uh, a micro uh, micro channel where with uh, two channel one is the top channel you see that is one millimeter by one millimeter in in uh, uh, rect uh, square uh, section and then in the bottom channel uh, that is much smaller you will have the vessels uh, excuse me the the red blood cells flowing and you have some pillars from which the red blood cells could diffuse and affect the bottom, uh, the top ch uh, channel in which you have the uh, bone marrow cells. Then we have a 3D printer in which we can tailor the macro channels that we, we have. Then in the macro channels, we have changed geometries, sizes, the pillars, and we finally arrive to the situation that is the best, in which you have the two, two channels. This is the top channel. This is the bottom channel. You see here the top channel, the bottom channel, the pillars. And then you have this, this geometry. Then you put the hydrogel uh, that is liquid. The hydrogel is a very it's a fantastic material. It's, it's a biomaterial that people are using now. Uh, it, this, the, 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 uh, journals about biomaterials are very, very hot in this, in this moment. And for example, you have a, a pluronic acid that you put in the refrigerator at four degrees and it's a liquid. And then you put a drop at, a, at a room temperature and it's elastic and you touch it and it's a solid, elastic solid. You take this elastic solid, you put it in the refrigerator and becomes liquid all the time. Or if you increase the temperature, becomes liquid all the time. So it has a transition that are very interesting. And simply the hydrogel is this, as I told you, is, is this um, a polymer cross-link that is a, for us is a porous media. But I asked this, my collaborator, but you know what is the diffusion coefficient there? They don't know anything. They don't know the microreology is something that is totally an open, an open question. Okay, then, for example, this has been our first uh, experiment uh, that we want to study uh, theoretically. Here you see the hydrogel. This is the, the top channel. This is the bottom channel. These are the pillars. And then we put the hydrogel. It's full of hydrogel now. And you see how it is starting to be uh, the liquid that we have put here. It diffuses through the hydrogel. And finally, all the, 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 the top channel is full of, of liquid. And for example, this is a Nice experiment to study. This is the like the first step in which finally we want to, to put uh, blood here. Here we will have 
the, the hydrogel, uh, the pillars will communicate the two chambers and the, the red blood cells will grow through the, uh, the, 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 the channel and with the bone marrow cells, we will have the, uh, the, the malaria infected uh, uh, organ on a chip. Then the per experiments that we have done are these. Here you see the top channel, the bottom channel, the pillars. And this is uh, with uh, fluorophore. Here we have the uh, erythroblasts that are the first steps of red blood cells that are around here. This is the green. And these are the blue that are the, the hydrogel. And you see how these are starting to diffuse. These are the first experiments that we have done on this topic. Okay. I have half an hour. Ah, okay. Okay. Then, uh, as a last example, as I uh, will explain to you uh, what are our results uh, studying vesicle. And in this case, uh, what is over time is the uh, how we characterize this type of system. Uh, here we have the membrane, the lipid bilayer. Uh, here is the free energy. This is the, uh, the uh, bending modulus that tell us what is the energy that costs to have curvature. This is the spontaneous curvature that tells me that the free energy is minimum. I mean, here is the mean curvature that you see have, when you have a surface, you have two radius of curvature. This one here that gives you the size and the other in this direction. And the C gives you the mean curvature. And the spontaneous curvature tells you when this term is zero. This means that the system prefers to have a curvature that is equal to the spontaneous curvature and produce uh, a, a, a PPL with this radius. And essentially, people uh, discard this term because you have the Gauss Bonnet theorem that tells you that this term is essentially related with the genus of the system. And if you don't change topology, this is a constant that you can forget because it's a constant introduced in the free energy. But we are interested to study process in which you have pinching. You have here the vesicle. The vesicle is growing. Now you have a vesicle with uh, this uh, neck. And then at some point, if this Gaussian curvature is there, you have the vesicle that is detached from the system. And then the point was how to go to a formalist in which this term with this free energy with these two terms are studied. And then uh, you can write a phase field uh, membrane uh, with Gaussian implementation. That is uh, our evolution, the other parameter with this Laplacian evolution of a uh, chemical potential, uh, the derivative of a free energy. It's a complicated equation with, uh, that you can derive from uh, tensors, etc. And here, the point is to study the evolution of this uh, membrane when you have temperature, okay? This is the evolution of, the, of a flat interface. When you have a temperature, here you have the bending. This is the diffusion coefficient associated the, 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 uh, to, the, to the noise, to the white noise that you have in your system. And uh, in, in this situation, for example, the membrane is fluctuating. As we saw at the beginning with our uh, red blood cell. Now it's a, uh, we are studying, for example, endocytosis or exocytosis in a flat interface. And in this case, what you can do? You can do many things here. For example, you have 
the, the, the interface. And we see that you can study a phase diagram in which you plot temperature versus the Gaussian curvature respect to the mean curvature. And you observe that the blue points are fluctuation. Here you have the fluctuation, but here you are in a regime in which you have vesiculation. And in the vesicular case, you have the pinching of the red blood cell, of the, of the, of the vesicle due to the presence of this temperature. When you have a smaller value of the curvature, this is a larger value of the radius, you need more temperature to vesiculate. And for what is useful this? Because now you can have mathematical uh, uh, expression, characterization of when the uh, vesicle will appear. In this case, you know that the chemical potential as a function of the time uh, tells you that at this point, when the, the thing increase, is that you have, is a region in you, you have vesiculation. You can characterize the process. Okay, and then the point is that the, uh, we want to do all together. We want to do, to study, uh, this is the first uh, uh, step for an organ on a chip. Here we have the pillars, red blood cells that uh, are pushed and for example, has parasitum and the parasitum is, is stopped there because they cannot cross. Uh, we want to study the, the, the pre rheologically, the hydrogel, uh, how the vascularization affect the cells. We want to study everything together. And uh, there are uh, is really, the collaboration with, uh, with experimentalists in this case is very important because to study all these topics, you have to be a specialist. For example, to have um, the PDMS membrane uh, uh, walls in a microchannel uh, is, is totally different if that you have collagen, for example. In the case of collagen, the cells flow easily and to have collagen in a wall is very complicated. You need uh, a very good uh, chemical procedure to do that. Then this means that we have the collaboration with experimentalists is very important. The collaboration with theoretical people is also very important. Here we have our collaboration, a theoretical collaboration. You know these people here, okay? And these are experimentalists, and these are, this is the experimental guy also, theoretical. This is the University of UNAM, and the University of Barcelona, Comillas. And these are the group in La Caixa. These are the people of biomaterials. This is the lady that is going to the field to take the parasitum and do the experiments. And my collaborator in the university, and this is the guy who knows everything about malaria is uh, Portillo. And we have the research foundation helping us with money because this is very expensive and we are happy. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Aurora, for this very interesting talk. And we now have uh, about 15 minutes for questions if we want to discuss it on the well, thank you, Aurora, for, for your very interesting talk. I heard many new things for me, and I was very impressed by this pitting of the malaria parasite. And I, I wonder if this is possible to be used in natural patients. I don't know how, but if, if there is some treatment that yeah. uses this property. It will be dia like a dia dialysis. You have the blood, you, you have... The, the point is you have dialysis uh, during the night, for example. You have the, the, the circuit and you produce this. You can have a, 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 in parallel different microchannel and with these uh, special uh, pillars. And then we, we have our first problem was that we were not sure if there will be hemolysis and the red blood cell will be broken. But it's not, not the case. I mean, the membrane is 
sufficiently elastic that the pitting is uh, sacar el hueso de la, de, de la aceituna. They go out of the, of, the, of the cell across the membrane without any difficulty. You can see a little bit of damage of the membrane, but it's, it's possible. If this will be the final solution, I don't know, but this, this is a procedure, yeah. But it's not being used yet. No. It's a possibility, but it's not being No, no, no. Okay, it's fantastic. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I want to tell people who are connected by Zoom that if they want to participate, they just put their hands on and we hear the questions again. Yeah. Uh, I was very puzzled because, yeah, I know that you're always fabricating new apparatus to, to biological things like these rheometer, micro rheometer, uh, which now is uh, about to be commercial, right? Mm -hmm. And I was very puzzled with the last thing, the, the, the artificial spleen. You, you, you are building this. Not yet. Not yet. This this was a, a we were very happy with that. Uh, you see here, for example, the the parasitum is here. Right. Okay. Uh, this has not been patented. The other the microreometer is patented, and we are in trying to to sell them. But in this case, uh, I don't know. I I we have not think about that. And how important is this uh, as a, an alternative therapy for this? For the I mean, because how we well, as, as Julia has, has, has asked the same question, is oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the natural question, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is, it, it, I mean, in, in, it's incredible that uh, because we were thinking that the, the, the cell breaks when you take the parasitum, yeah. but it's not true. I mean, the cell is very, very elastic. It creates poro and the parasitum go out. And then this is like 90% of the cell are, are okay, are, 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 are well, no, not, not leasing. There is no leasing. Yeah, but in fact, in our idea to, in the malaria at the moment, because this was the first collaboration that we did with the group in malaria and in Barcelona. But uh, our idea now is with the organ on a chip to, to study, because there is a, a, a name that is exosoma that plays a very important role. This is this vesicle that tells you if you have malaria and plays an important role in, in the spleen, and we are in more in this direction than to 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 do to go to the pitting effect. But yeah, it's it's a possibility. Can I, oh, somebody. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. All right. I thought you were going to talk about this new therapy that we proposed for uh, uh, bacterial infections based only on the elastic properties of the membrane. Because I think that is a very interesting example of the kind of research that you always do. Yes. Which has an yeah. altruistic end, so to speak. Cure yeah. illnesses. Yeah. People better. Well, uh, the, in fact, the thing that, that we are doing in, in this sense is more diagnosis. So we are making diagnosis of, and, and this is, we are in collaboration with a, a group in, uh, in, in in Bangkok that are doing the study of the of the of the uh, disease uh, there, and we will they will have our our apparatus to make the diagnosis uh, to to do the the therapy. Uh, what in what sense do you think that is? No, no, we were proposing by adding up some type of body for molecules to the cellular membrane, we change the elastic properties of the membrane. Uh -huh. So we were thinking of Skirikia coli uh, uh, infections that could be 
Ah, the Monroy board. Right, because if you yeah. make the membrane harder, they don't divide. The, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. Don't yeah. The, yeah, this, yeah, 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 yeah. And this the, is very important. Ultimately, you don't need to kill the bacteria. The only thing that is a problem for you is that they divide and they engage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is a, another, 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 yeah, with this, this is another possibility, yeah. Uh, well, this is, a, this is published, and I don't know if somebody wants to do anything on that, but uh, yeah, there are many, with these uh, elastic properties, you have many, many different procedures, and I, I cannot do everything. Maybe you can plan to, to do a, a, a <laughs> okay. Some other uh, in questions from the public here. Uh, perhaps uh, the YouTube uh, audience, uh, you know, if somebody wants to pose the question. Meanwhile, perhaps I can ask you also. Uh, uh, very interesting. We talked about the possibilities of this. Uh, so, in principle, uh, it would be useful for any illness where let's say uh, the vector or something coupled to blood cells. Yeah. For example, the, the cancer, the blood yeah. cells. For example, le leukemia, uh, not only red blood cells, the white cell. Yeah. The white cells also change the rigidity and the rigidity. For example, uh, if the problem with, in, in the case of malaria, the problem with malaria is that uh, the rigidity of the cell is increased so much that the best, the, the small capillars in the brain are broken, and especially the children die from this reason. This means that the rigidity of, of cells are very important. And it's not so simple to have a modeling of this of this rigidity, you know, and to measure it with uh, with apparatus and and to measure at the scale at the small scale, because if you have a large scale you lose this sensitivity to the rigidity, but you do go to very small scale, the rigidity with only one cell, you immediately detect the effect. I'm sorry, and how far are the, let's say the applications to you of humans, to, for example, doing this kind of dialysis for malaria? How many years perhaps to, to try this really in humans? Uh, this, this I, uh, in my field, I am trying to do to do diagnosis. I am I I don't don't do treatment, but I would be happy to help. But you're doing already tests on animals. Or no. Nothing. Okay. Okay. The work is very interesting. Suppose there are people who will do the other part of the application, right? Uh, well, I will be happy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Are there any questions in the phone? Okay. No. Then just that's one question because we have time. A very naive. When you showed the, the first results in the lab of how you you saw the red blood cells in the flow, what struck me is I don't know. At, at the beginning, it was in some sense they took kind of funky. It was opposite to the flow, no? mm -hmm. transversal, and then it started to modify its shape. But uh, one would think that perhaps to reduce uh, friction, which the first thing the funky should do is try to uh, rotate ninety degrees. No? And, and why doesn't it do it? Uh, well, the, the fact is that uh, when you increase, the, the, this is a well-known uh, fact, the shape, depending on the velocity changes, the, the, first, the, the first shape is the, the disco side, the healthy one. When you increase the velocity, the, the system moves, as you say, but when you increase more the velocity, the, the effect of the membrane becomes less important, and then you have like a bullet. And then this is the, and this is only known because you have the free energy that tells you that this is the final solution. And experimentally, there, you see there. Well, do you have any more questions for Aurora? No. Well, let us thank you very much for okay. very nice talk. So, in the duration of the, the topic, no, I would like to tell you why I would like to study interface. The purpose of the study interfaces for me is have a connection with biological systems. I think that uh, interfaces can be used as a 
or can drive a correlation with physical fields in the evolution of biological systems. So to study what happened in an interface, it's uh, like uh, know how a phase field uh, or phase transition occurs in a biological system. So thank you. In that duration, uh, I study interface and I will talk about some topological transition. Uh, Aurora said something about uh, one approach that I use for study. So I will go to the history and I will present Huffer's model. That is a model that contains uh, contrib energy contributions by Hubert returns. And I will tell you how this uh, interpret interpretation of the uh, uh, bending curvature and, and curvatures have uh, uh, shapes in the in the evolution of, of some of, of something that is connected with the with radiological systems and not only with membranes. Uh, this is what. So uh, the outline is is this one, and I will tell you at the end of the talk uh, a phase a phase diagram that connected the shakes in the last game, and I will introduce the some something that we did uh, in the last years that have connection with drops and surfactant. So let me tell you something about these equilibrium shapes. There are a proposed that Helfrich did 50 years ago uh, in this in, in the first paper. Uh, Helfrich was interested in elastic properties and, and in lipid build layer. So uh, he proposed a connection with uh, the curvature terms in terms of energy. In this case, uh, we have a connection with the mean and spontaneous curvature, as Aurora tells us, is the cause that a uh, flat membrane or a lipid layer can obtain uh, the, bending, the bending form and have a contribution of Gaussian curvature that means change in topology. Uh, this, this term is not uh, really studied very well. It's a uh, little understanding, but it's important for the formation of different shapes. Uh, as, uh, as, as we know, no, this and the Gaussian term is connected with, uh, with the genius of the surface and, and really is connected with if the uh, number of holes or handles in, in the surface. So it's, uh, this, term, this term contributes to the energy in just in, uh, uh, to increase the, the thermal energy as a scalar if the surface doesn't change. But it's changed, it have a, a big contribution in the, in the evolution. Here I would like to present another another terms that uh, I would like to, to say there is a volume and surface constraints because uh, uh, really uh, what happened with the energy uh, are limited what the constraints in the in the surface and the and the volume and I would like to say this because at the end of the talk uh, I use a approximation of free energy to introduce a a volume constraints and surface constraints in, in some drops with surfactants. Uh, let me tell you something about this, this term that is connected with the talk that is uh, Gaussian Bonnet curing and topological constraints. If we change the genius of, uh, sorry, if we change the genius, we increase the holes in the system or we'll increase the number of objects in the system. So this contribution will be important and help us Take it in account, and uh, this phase in this phase diagram. So uh, what we see here is an important result of this uh, paper of Helfrich that can connect the bending the bending modulus of, of the bending module that are connected with the bending energy and Gaussian terms. In this uh, diagram, we have a connection uh, or a critical connection that are related with the the K models that are the bending modulus and another K that is connected with the Gaussian modulus. So uh, in terms of energy, we have a contribution in in the relation that it is here. So we have the formation of many vesicles if 
if the, these modules are below this line, and we have one big visible if there are over that line, and we have lattice passage or the production of some handles. This is important for different things. Uh, for example, uh, well, biological is, is important uh, for the formation of some little bicycles or big bicycles. And in biological, it's a very interesting problem because uh, the gold use apparatus needs uh, the formation or produce uh, vesicles in different size. And I would like to explain how this occurs. The contribution of health risks are stationary uh, in, in the terms of energy. And I would like to say uh, or to know how it will be increasing in the, in the, in the, in the time. So in that duration, uh, a phase field approach is an, uh, a very important approach. And when I know this approach, I will love it for the rest of my life because it connects uh, different things in what's happening in the interfaces and have different contributions that are important. And I will tell you uh, right now. Uh, the, this uh, uh, approach uses an, another parameter that has a file that is connected with hyperbolic target that depends on the distance to the surface uh, or distance to the, the phase moves. And we have a diffuse interface that is connected with uh, what happened in the, in, in, the, in the size of memory. And we can produce, more and we can obtain different uh, things in, in, this, in this approach. Particularly, we can obtain the normal vector of the surface. We can obtain, if we calculate the derivatives, uh, the tensor curvature, and we obtain some connection with the uh, surface area with the volume. Uh, here is, I tell you what is important and why I love this approach. Uh, first, uh, here, the tensor curvature is an invariant. It's a topology, well, this is an, a tensor that have the uh, very, well, have, depending on the main, in the dimension, different variants. In three dimension, uh, this tensor is symmetric. So we, we, if we calculate the, the, derivative, the derivative of uh, the tensor, uh, they have a, a, a eigenvalue problem that have eigenvalues equal zero. So this is the one invariant. And the other invariants are connected with the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature that I will tell you in the next line. And the other thing is, uh, uh, when we can modulate the, what happened in the surface in a, or interface of um, some physical or some mathematical model, we know or we have to know the system of coordinates of the system. So if the if the if the phase change, we have to know what we need is the evolution of these coordinates change in the in the in the system. So here the phase field model approach. Uh, it doesn't matter how the, these, uh, let, let me tell you, these uh, vectors or these uh, coordinates in the, in the flat membrane or in the interface changes, just I would like to know how the volume change. And this is a very, very uh, interesting property because we don't need a uh, metric in the surface. Yeah. Well, in, the, the connection with, with the, this tensor curvature with the other two invariants are here. We can, uh, the other two invariants are the, the sum of the, of the diagonal of the, of, the, of the vector that are the, the trace of the, the, the tensor curvature that are will connected with the mean curvature. And the other thing is that the uh, Gaussian curvature will be connected with some uh, uh, special things with this tensor curvature that maybe it, it look like that. Like, like determinant of the of the of the tensor curvature. But here is uh, what we want to say is that uh, the connection with the curvature tensor uh, will be allows to know how the Gaussian curvature uh, evolution. And uh, the other thing that I would tell you is how this will be uh, contribute in the dynamical evolution. It's an approach that is a Kahn Hillier approach that use a conservation volume and you have a diffusion term here that maybe, well, here is, is one. And in connection with the uh, uh, 
the function derivative function derivative of the energy that is connected here. Um, we have a, as a, as a, we see now this is a problem uh, very no, with high no linearities. So when we can integrate this, we have a problem here because phi uh, are loss or, or less one in the phase. So we have a, a, a very discontinuity here. So how we can solve this equation uh, is uh, maybe there is no, no trivia, but uh, we use, uh, we use a, 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 Cauchy, a Cauchy theory to resolve the problem. So we com convert phi as a complex variable and we use uh, the Cauchy theorem to uh, integrate this, this equation. Uh, let me let me see how this works in in a numerical simulation. We prove uh, what happened with this Gaussian curvature and uh, in 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 this in the field in the in the field of the of the of this. Let me let me return a lot. Uh, in terms of this uh, this model that it contrib they have the contribution of Gaussian curvature uh, in terms of this other model. So uh, what he will have is if the Gaussian model is equal to zero, we have in this phase diagram just one big uh, vesicle. So what we have here is uh, initial condition of pi uh, and then evolution in time. And we have that this evolution in time produce just one uh, big vesicle model. One one vesicle, and if we use uh, uh, other different value of these bending models connect with these Gaussian models, we have this vision of the initial condition of, of one one tube. Uh, here is important to know that, uh, or the importance of the, the contribution of Gaussian curvature is that we have a fission or fission in the in the in the system. So. Uh, not, not only that, we, we explore more and we do a uh, big cube, yeah? Ah, yeah, the color scale means the energy of the system. Yeah, this, uh, I plot in the color scale how many energy the system has, yeah? So here, uh, yeah, here, here the, we, we see uh, that the color scale is blue, is connected with the energy and Gaussian energy that it have a negative module. So we increase the negative, the increase the, the this uh, parameter, we reduce the energy. And I will tell you in the, in, in the next uh, slides how this will be using to know uh, the, the, the code or the fission of the, some vesicles. Here, well, I we studied a large, a large uh, tube. So what we see this is in the evolution of the time. This is the evolution of the time. We, uh, the this tube will be uh, present some pearly instability. That the important thing of this slide is that this pearly occurs in sequentially in the time. So for the first first one, we don't have pinching or one of pinching of membranes. Then we have a one pinching and we reduce the energy. Hope here again the color scale is the energy, the energy scale. So here we reduce, or the energy will be reduced and it will be in sequence the time. So the parallel instability would appear in the time corresponds and a sequence uh, fission of, them, of, this, of, the, of this tube. So we prove that in, in, this, in this slide. So uh, first in, in red, we have a initial condition of pi and then in, in, in black, we have the final condition of, of, of these, uh, uh, these uh, order parameters that have some fissions. Um, but you know, also we have some things that we can measure in the system and we can measure the volume, the area, and we see that this may be conserved in the, in the time and the, the, the area. Uh, we measure the bending energy and Gaussian energy. What we see is that the bending energy, that this is the cause the energy, the, the membrane or the vesicle cures is, um, relative constant in the time, but we have that the Gaussian energy that is important for the efficient of the vesicles will be increasing before the, the vesicle will form. 
here we uh, put in black diamonds the instance of the formation of these bicycles in the time. So before the uh, vesicle fission, of the, we have uh, increase in the Gaussian energy that tells us that is a big contribution of this distance. Um, and we, well, and this is I'm, I'm parody, as, as I tell you, you know, this is an sequential form of the basic formation in the time. So well, what we see is reproduce the phase diagram that Humphrey tells us in that article. And in terms of these parameters, in terms of a phase field parameters that here, what is important is again, the bending and Gaussian moduli in the system. Here we have a big vesicle, small vesicles, and also we can produce some handles in the system. So here is a transition that is the, the topic of the tall topological transitions when when the Gaussian uh, modulus increase it is positive in the system. Uh, how how somewhere? Five minutes, 10, 10, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, here we have a couple of uh, mathematical uh, ingredients to produce what we want to produce in terms of energy cost. So we can produce uh, with this mathematical model the small vesicles that also will correlate with the spontaneous curvature. So these uh, vesicles will be connected with the spontaneous curvature will be small or bigger depending on that. But we have uh, all the ingredients to produce big vesicles and passage in a uh, system. So what we need or what we do in, in the last year is uh, use this approach to uh, connect with what happened in a membrane that are related with uh, the the mix it of some, some substance in a water drop. I will resume this story because in the next talk, Alberto tells us how this works. Uh, but I, in, in, the, in the short story that I will tell you is that we have a, a water drop that we can bend on in, uh, in a one pipe. And this drop have a sun components that are measured, that are cycle streams and solutions. Cycle streams are uh, some molecules that will, they are uh, molecules that have a one ring, well, that are this, uh, one ring, will have a ring that can, uh, that this ring is uh, hydrophobic and some surfactants will be introduced then and can be changed the properties of the, of the, of the drop. Uh, here will, uh, we have is a, uh, a stationary uh, condition of the drop depending on concentration of these cyclic streams and surface solutions. As I'll tell you, uh, uh, Alberto will tell us in more detail in the next talk what is uh, this uh, chemical components. But the, the important here is that depending on concentration of these uh, mixing substance, we have different initial conditions in uh, a drop that is pendant. So here, in the A, we have a low concentration of this substance in the drop water, and we increase to critical uh, concentration of these uh, molecules. And we have we, what we see is that depending on concentration of these uh, molecules in the system, we uh, have a different equilibrium shape in at the beginning. Uh, here, that have a, a, a an experimental critical concentration. Of this we have the form of some neck that don't happen here. So this tell us that the, this uh, combination substance can change the uh, elastic properties uh, or, or, uh, of, the, of, the, of the drop in, in the surface. Uh, we have in, in, the, in, in, the other, in this direction, the tiny evolution to the equilibrium of the, the drop. When, they have, uh, uh, when we have small concentration of this, Substance, we have the conventional uh, going to the stationary equilibrium state for one drop. So we have a, a, a spherical drop that we you know we don't uh, need. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an unconventional. You don't the, the the paper of the surface tension is as as, as we know. But when we increase the the concentrations, we have important important thing. So the 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 last 
uh, drop uh, when we increase the this concentration substance in the drop can change the form and particular change in this in this way. Here is is connected with the vesicle formation because uh, depending on the size of the vesicles is uh, how the elastic property will be used in a, in a system. Particularly, this uh, will be used in the therapy uh, implementations for for drug development. Uh, so we have some evidence of these uh, concentrations. Uh, what we know, as Alberto told you, told us, uh, is that uh, Alberto and Miguel uh, Miguel Costas, you know, the, is that uh, bending the, well, the dilatation modulus increases in some important order of magnitudes, and the tension, uh, the surface tension chains in some particular uh, in some particular forms. What we is interested in is what happened here. That's in a critical transformation of surfactant and cyclodestines. But I'm just uh, present here to prove it. It's, it's, it's a function of how surfactants and cyclodestines there are in 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 in, in water. Yeah? But as I tell you, uh, Alberto will say more about this experimental data because it is desperate. Uh, what we do as a, a theoretical, mathematical or physics uh, story, is implementation of this field approach to, you know, to, uh, to say or to, to know how this uh, uh, drops evolution. So as I tell you at the beginning of the, of the talk, we have a contribution, uh, we have a contribution of uh, <laughs> we have a contribution of of, of um, curvature and some constraints. So here the constraints we put it as the horse, as Rafael tells us uh, uh, in some story. This 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 horse is connected with the uh, with some uh, properties of this substance. Uh, these properties are dipole dipole interactions that are uh, and the distribution of these dipoles in the surface and. Uh, uh, the surface tension also is connected with 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 that with the the dipole dipole interactions. So uh, the model that we present here is is that is this and here is uh, this contribution of the constraints of the system what happened in the surface and can be reduced in these two terms. This is the first time in the history in, that appears a gradient plus uh, a gradient. Uh, square, and this is uh, what what we say. What I, what I say this term is that the contribution of the, the this part from surface tension will be important and will be competed with this with this term if the divergence of this term reduce. So th this delta is the contribution of uh, dipole dipole interaction that constraint, and this uh, gamma is connected with the surface tension. So what we present here at the end is how we put a initial condition as the experiment and with different concentrations, and we have the evolution of the phase field parameter, and we obtain the drops that are uh, reported or that Alberto and Miguel Costa saw in the experiment. So it's, uh, with, with, with this, I, I, I will finish. What I would tell you that, uh, is that the phase diagram that we obtain with topological transitions with some constraints and with this approach of uh, energy approach, we can obtain different different um, mathematical models to obtain what we want to obtain, uh, what the experiment tells us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. Now we have about uh, eight minutes for questions. Oh. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for your talk, Roberto. And I want to know the story of the horse, please. Yeah. Okay. Rafael, is you, you want to, 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 to tell all the story of the horse? This is. It is a joke. Question. It's in a joke. It, yeah. yeah and I, and I cannot say a bad word about it in, in, in Zoom, but anyhow. The thing is that we were meeting with uh, Roberto and Aurora and Alberto, 
uh, looking at this problem in the cycle next spring, changing the elastic properties of, of the droplets. And the idea was that the physical uh, reason for that was these molecules have uh, are polar, and they have dipole moments. Uh, and the idea was that probably it was a dipole-dipole interaction, the one that was responsible for this uh, new force that increased the elastic modulus of the droplet. And, but I mean, that's a idea peregrina because uh, usually dipole, in, dipole interactions are very small because they decay like uh, the distance to the sixth power. So if you separate the electric charges a little bit, then there is no force anymore. So that's why you never take them into account in physics, probably. Uh, so we well, so we decided to make some uh, uh, mm. calculations okay. by hand to see if the dipole dipole interactions were able to give us a force that could be taken into account. So we had all these physical constants. If you, if you show the force, yes. I mean, we shouldn't talk about the force. No, I don't know. Uh, you see, but, but maybe Alberto will tell us how the force is. <laughs> potential energy of the electric field. You see, the energy goes like the distance of the dipole. third power to the minus three. And here is the dipole moment and the number of dipoles. And so I will say some that. effective distance here. And this actually is a separation between them. And and so on. I mean, we all, these are physical constants, so you cannot fiddle them. I mean, it's just, they have a value. It's not like a, a student of man that said, let's assume that H bar goes to zero. Come on. No. I mean, you cannot say that. I mean, H bar is H bar, right? So we didn't have any choice. So we make the, put the values there and we got the answer wrong by 12 orders of magnitude. 10 to the 12. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so when that happens, usually you just scratch the paper, turn it to the waste, and, and you forget about the problem. But that night, I was thinking and thinking, well, how come that we got the thing wrong for uh, yeah. so much? Yeah. And suddenly it came to me the answer. I, we were wrong a little bit in the in the scale of of the and the disposition of the dipoles, right? Because we were taking some distances in the wrong way. So we, I came the next morning to all of them and said, "I've got the horse. I found the horse." Yeah. And said, so "What? Yeah, that horse." Because, I mean, this comes from a joke that some parents have two children. One was optimistic and the other was pessimistic. And they wanted to fix that. So in the King's Night, Los Reyes Magos, right? the epiphany in Mexico, uh, parents give toys uh, and, and presents to the children. So they decided to fix that. So the, to the pessimistic one, they put some balloons and cars and bicycles and so on. And to the optimistic one, they put a piece of uh, um, waste uh, uh, food, four letters horizontal, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which we could say pop up, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then uh, next morning he said, well, how is it to the pessimistic? I've got a bike, but I'm going to fall down. I'm going to hurt myself. I've got a boil, but it's going to go over the wall and the children will take it for me. Come on. And to the optimistic one said, what, ha what have you got? And he says, I've got a horse, I'm looking for it. 
So this is my horse. Yeah, this is the horse. <laughs> Yes, yes, I think you, you forgot to tell uh, the motivation of this cycle of the extreme. Yeah, yeah, but, but that, that's the turn of Alberto. So I, I reduce the, the yes, I put the, the, the idea in the system and how we use the, the facing model approach to do the simulation of that. And perhaps I know if there are any questions from the YouTube audience. So if you can raise your hand if you think that we are in the next topic. If there are no questions, thank you. Anybody else to take notes? Uh, I, I perhaps will take notes of something in, in this last example. Yeah. You know, uh, there is no perming. Uh, no, there is no, there is no, no, there is no perming because the Gaussian and bending modulus are in the over the line that there is the critical line. No, not really because we can conserve the volume. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, then we can pass to the thank again. <laughs> Thank you. Then, have the next speaker getting ready. And this will be uh, Dr. Alberto Sanchez Luviano, who's working for the UNAM. Um, he's at the moment a postdoc at is... the Faculty of Chemistry of UNAM. Uh, and he's also working in the interactions in between cyclodextrics. Oh, ah, no. in the Asia, air, water, uh, and we have done previous studies in physics at the Universidad de Michoacana, the San Nicolás Hidalgo, um, studying, uh, well, rheologic studies and thermodynamics uh, of bidimensional lipidic monolayers. Um, and, uh, and also previous postdoc in the University of Guanajuato. Alberto Sanchez Luviano, in a moment, is going to talk to us about highly viscoelastic films in the air cyclodextrin surfactant interface. So, that is not the actual name of the talk, but ah, well, that's the one in the program. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, now you know, you tell us the last version of the time. Okay, start when you want. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm still working in the on this thing. They let me. You can hear me? Yes. But meanwhile, I, I would like to talk uh, to thank Rafael for the invitation. I'm very grateful for it. And ah, wait. it doesn't work. I will do talk about these type of lipo interactions that he mentioned, but it was a surprise. Now I got spoiled.
¿Vale? Pero es que también tengo videos. Entonces no sé si. Y sin los videos, without the videos, this talk is. Well, this good one, but. No, 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 Pues no. es un discurso. Ah, sí. Solo es la presentación. Sí, se llama presentación. Es que los videos están, se supone que están pegados en... Uh -huh. Es que sí. Sí, sí, claro, sí. Ahora déjame te paso el, el. Es que le hice unas pequeñitas modificaciones. Sí. Déjame rápido que lo copie. Sí. Sí, pero con esto la marcha. Ahora es la que está afuera.
Sí. Ahí. En el blanco funciona con el lector blanco de la mano. El otro con el otro con el que estamos comprando. Ah. Ahí conecto el tema. Sí, listo. Sí, listo. Sí, listo. ¿Está en el escritorio? Sí, está en el escritorio. Ya te la abrí. Ya te la abrí. Sí, estoy viendo si sí es. Sí, sí es. Creo que ya. Okay. Now we are back on track. It was a change of laptop, and, and we are using uh, Roberto's one again. Uh, so, uh, well, Alberto, uh, welcome to present your talk. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna um, in this talk. I'm gonna um, walk you through a series of experimental techniques that we use to. Understand and to characterize these, uh, we know uh, we call highly viscoelastic films at the air water interface. And well, uh, to start, um, I'm going to show you the motivation uh, for this for, for studying these these systems. Um, in these two videos, I'm going to show you uh, how to create how we create a pendant and drop, and then we suck the drop in. Uh, we know that when you have water. Um, This is not, uh, it is not really shocky, no? The, the drop, um, the, the shape of the drop doesn't change um, practically nothing. But in our system, when we um, create the drop, then we suck the drop in, we see this very dramatic change in the, in the shape, no? Actually, for a few seconds, this neck um, doesn't break, And actually, it recovers, and the drop uh, goes up, right? Um, I'll let you finish. So someone that hasn't seen this solution um, in a flask or whatever, uh, you may think this is a non-Newtonian uh, fluid, right? But we also measure it, and it turns out that it is not just non-Newtonian, not just Newtonian, but it actually has the viscosity of water. So the, the effect that we saw there is purely interfacial. Okay, so now that I'll show you the motivation, what are the molecules that are composed or system? These are very um, I widely studied molecules. The first one is uh, surfactant, sodium dodecyl sulfate, that um, has a hydrophobic region and a polar region. And the second one is the alpha cyclodextrin. This is not very, but it is widely studied, but not everyone knows this molecule, right? This one came from the enzymatic degradation of a starch. So it is a, a very novel molecule um, for, I mean, for, for us, for, it's not non-toxic. Uh, but the main characteristic of this molecule is its geometry. You can see that it resembles a hollow uh, truncated cone, which in the inner region is an hydrophobic, is hydrophobic, and in the outer region is hydrophobic. These both molecules are very have a very good solubility in water. So when we mix them, um, we expect that the, the surfactant introduced into the cyclodextrin somehow. This is known, this, is, this has been studied for many um, other molecules that are hydrophobic. 
In pharmaceutics, for example, uh, is used as a um, solubilizer of hydrophobic molecules and also in drug delivery. And it has been used as um, removal of cholesterol in dairy products and well in food industry is also well used. So what we want to know is how this surfactant interacts with this acrylation. But we can see here that it may be inclusion complexes that has one hydrophobic molecule and through, through cyclodextrins, we actually know that this is what we see. But to understand in our system, what we do first was to perform molecular dynamic simulations. When we have a starting conformation, um, for example, we have two cyclodextrins and one surfactant, or we have one cyclodextrin and two surfactants, and we let the system evo evo evolution and we see that the more stable complexes that we can see are the 2-1 complex and the 1-1 complex. So for our system, we can say that we have these two complexes and also we can have free surfactant or free cyclodexin, you know, depending on the concentration. Uh, in this videos, I'm gonna show you how, how this complexation can be seen macroscopically. So, as I told you, this surfactant is, has a very good solubility in water, but it, it turns out that if we change the, the counter ion for a potassium, this molecule is totally insoluble. So what we do here is that we, we add this potassium chloride to the surfactant solution, and we will see how how it become, be, becomes insoluble. Now this is a clear solution, then the, the potassium chloride make them insoluble. Right? So if to this solution, we add water, let's say to dilute, dilute them and see if they, it is now soluble, we, we can see that this doesn't happen. Right? With just water, the solution keeps, um, it scatters like, but if we instead, we add a solution that contains cyclodextrin, we can see how this solution now turns clear again, right? Um, it takes a few seconds. So this experiment is very demonstrative, but it doesn't say much about what do have in bulk, right? You can only speculate that you have these complexes. Right, that this is the comparison between these two. So the first technique we use to, to know really what we have in the bulk is isothermal titration calorimetry, where we can measure the heat from some interaction between anyhow molecules. Uh, this, this experiment works in the following way. Uh, you have two identical cells where you put uh, the same solution. Then you titrate the, the second molecule and you wanna see that by titrate, titrating this molecule, some heat is, um, but some, you can measure the heat from the interaction, right? So, That's. If we use this technique, um, we obtain the, the heat from those interactions. And it turns out that if we use a model that include these four uh, species, the heat from the experiments uh, doesn't need any free parameters, doesn't have any free parameters. No, so the we can say that it is a very good model for what we can see in this experiment. What we do is with, with some balanced mass equation, we can calculate how much of these species are in the solution. See, we, here we have um, the total um, concentration of cyclodextrin that should be in the free cyclodextrin in the 1-1 complexes and in the 2-1 um, complexes, no? 
This two is because there are two cyclo strings in that complex. And the, where is the total surfactant? Well, it is in, in the free surfactant and the one one complex and in the two one complex. If we solve this, this um, nonlinear system of equations, we can obtain the distribution of species by uh, increasing surfactant and fixing the cyclodextrin in the, in the reference cell. So we can see that when there is no surfactant, the only species will be free cyclodextrin. But we, when we start to titrate the surfactant, this free cyclodextrin drops and the formation of the two one complexes start to rise, right? Uh, after certain critical concentration, the one one complex start to appear and then the free surfactant when there is not enough cyclodextrin to complex it. So this is, this is now not just demonstrative, but it tells us what we have in the bulk. But again, the effect that we saw in the first video was an interfacial effect, right? Not in the bulk, but in the end, the interface will be a reflect that what you have in bulk. So by many uh, surface techniques, we study this, this interface and using nitro reflectometry, neutron reflectometry, we were able to, to say what, which of these species have in the, in the surface, right? So for example, for a deep, um, low value of this uh, coefficient ratio, we know that only can have um, free cyclodextrin and two one complexes in the bulk. No? But with, with Newton reflectometry, we can calculate how many of these are, um, I don't know, uh, two one complexes, free, free cyclodextrin. We use no surfactant because we know uh, that there is no present. And actually, our model only, um, only can have, uh, can only have two, two species, no? For the best fit was, was that. And water, water is, when you use neutron reflectometry, you need to have um, water, deuterated water and normal water. So it will be seen in the experiment. So what we see is that in fact, uh, the two one complexes are more um, likely to be in the surface, even when there is um, way less than the free cyclo extreme, right? And we do this for the for for four um, concentration ratios because it is kind of expensive to doing this do these experiments, and the time that they give you to do this is like two or three days. No? These three days, the people that did this um, barely sleep. So the, the, the fourth one, I didn't put you here because, well, the, the scale doesn't reach, but we see that at this concentration, there is only surfactant. So what we can tell us, what we can tell about that is that when you have um, free surfactant or enough free surfactant, the surface that once had um, to one complexes of free surfactant will be uh, displaced by these surfactants, free surfactants, right? So the, the um, interfacial uh, properties will be as if we just have a uh, surfactant. No? The other complexes will be in the bulk now. Um, also, we can say that so free surfactant is way more hydrophobic than these two other species. What? No, this was in the it was it was a um, um, setup that the the one who did it. Um, I, I think this is the first time we the, they use this this setup for measuring in the air water interface. So this was done in the yes yes. 
Yes, that is reported in, in the Journal of Colloid Interface Science that we do, we did. And yes, uh, it was in the interface. So, the one one complex does not agree with the same. Uh, yes, but the result from the neutral reflectometry, um, if we add these one one complexes in for the best fit, uh, really didn't help. So, we left it uh, out of the fit, right? So, yes. But, it should appear, but but we didn't uh, use them in this calculation. Um, so we saw that that well, not so because this we can see the the film with these experiments. But we do a uh, Bruce triangle microscopy, which there is a microscopy, so we can see now that there is a there is a film there in the interface. Well, it was a video, but yes, these experiments were performed in a language true when where we can um, compress and expand the interface. So the movement that we saw here is because we compress it and then we expand it. But what we see is that there is a film in the interface, right? If we see just black, there were no reflection, and the interface will be free for from a minute. But with this, we do see this. So, what we do to keep um, understanding these systems was to measure surface tension. I mean, we have an interface. The the I would think that the the best or the first property that you can measure is surface tension. So we use uh, for this a drop tensiometer um, where the, the, the device resolves the John Laplace equation. Uh, and for a um, fixed uh, phase, I mean, water and air in this case, the surface tension only depends on the shape of the drop, right? So I put this, these drops with different shapes and the surface tension that the system measures. I put this angle just to, to make it clear, the, the, the change in the shape, but are not in the, in the calculations. So one of the first um, measures that, that, we, that they usually do in this type of experiments is to calculate the uh, critical micelle concentration that it is the concentration at which the surfactants or any molecule start to form micelles. Right? So what we do is that we put the drop and let the surface tension to equilibrate to reach a um, equilibrium point. And the values here are the ones of the, at the end of the, of the equilibrium time. What we see was the first, one well, not the first, but an uncommon uh, behavior, crucially, when you measure uh, this, this, when you do these experiments, you see that the, the surface tension drops in a monotonically way. But for our system, we see a drop, then a um, rise, and then again a drop. No, we see a local minimum and local maximum. This is the first um, uncommon thing that we saw there. So we have now experiment from the board. We have experiment from the interface. How can we link these two? What we do is that um, we blame from this fault from this fault to the competition between the two one complexes and the free cyclodextrin. Then, uh, then the um, the rise in this curve. Um, it's um, again from the competition. Now, the two one complexes are one, the ones that are winning in the interface. And after a moment, um, the one one complexes start to appear and then the surface tension begins to, to drop. No? And obviously when the free, free surfactant appears, the drop just falls, right? So this is the kind of the, how we explain 
the, the, the reflection in the interface from the bulk. But still, um, when we see the first, the first video, we see a, a dramatic change in the, in the shape of the drop. So this will be um, totally um, due to the change in the surface tension, right? So what we do is perform interfacial rheology. We use the, the same tensiometer and we um, apply oscillations in the area. We impose these oscillations and we measure the response in surface tension. You can see here that the drop actually changed. Uh, this is this maybe not drastically as we see in the first video, but there is a huge change in surface tension from 45 to 71, right? So that's, that's a lot actually. So with this, uh, we can measure the dilatation modulus of the drop of the interface, and we can relate with the elastic modulus and the viscous modulus. Well, with this equation, no? the elastic modulus is in phase with the deformation and the other one is out of phase. Usually uh, you have a combination of two. There is very unlikely that you see a, a interface that is just elastic or just viscous, but you have that one, one that dominates. So we use these uh, experiments on many surfactants. I showed you just four here. Um, in all of them, we see a drop in surface tension, then a rise and then a drop again. But what we see is that the dilatational modulus, it's always, oh, well, it has this behavior, no? it grows and falls down, or also falls down here and here too. What we saw is that this dilatational modulus is really high compared with um, any other surfactant that, has, that people have measured. It may be just comparable with Proteins, for example, but proteins are very complex molecules that when they go to, inter to the interface, they expose hydrophobic uh, regions and then can have a lot of uh, conformational changes. So this is, for us, this is a really remarkable behavior for this system. So we now know a lot of these, um, of these molecules in the interface but we still didn't know how to model it physically, you know, or mathematically. So what we did, what we did was the, we, bring, we brought this information to someone that you may know, right? He also talked about it. He has spoiled He spoiled my, my talk. Uh, and we show in this video, you know, this video, if I remember well, uh, he was very impressed with that, with the, uh, the neck, the formation of this neck. And, what we, what, well, he started to think about the, the problem and what was going through his head, he can only know. But if you ask me, it was something like this, right? And after a few minutes, he, he just came with, with that, no? Very simple, should be dipole-dipole interactions. Uh, the quotes that Kimo presented us today from Newton and Einstein will be very uh, proud of that sentence, right? I mean, that's not a far-fetched idea because we have a very polar molecules in a very polar medium, so bipolar dipole interactions should be or could be. Uh, when you have many time, or when you have, say, when you have passed many, many time with the same system, you can see the more obvious reasons, right? But when we, bring this information to him, but simple. And so what he do was to uh, assume that there is a n number of dipoles. In, ah, I didn't say it, but the viscoelastic modulus, um, the dilatational modulus until here, we blame the two one complexes. From all the experimental um, evidence, we say the two one mole, Complexes are the, the, um, the guilty. So he say, if you have an um, of this dipole in the interface, you have an energy that goes like this. And then um, the surface tension is just the energy per unit of area. So simple as that. And the dilatational modulus, 
it's the change of surface tension due to the change in the area, right? So we can see that this modulus is a monotonically uh, increasing function of concentration. So we can see the rise in the dilatational modulus, but the drop that we saw, uh, that until here it cannot be explained, right? So, well, this is how we calculate the, the dipolar uh, dipole moment. So how we can um, amend this equation to see the drop in the dilatational modulus, uh, what we do is that first we have a lot of these two one complexes, but then when the, the surfactant increases, you start to see the other species. These other species, what, we, what they are going to do is to separate the two one complexes, and therefore the distance between dipoles will be increased. So the interaction uh, will be decreased, right? And what we see too is that the interfacial tension can be explained with um, first uh, change due to the dipoles and uh, change due to the increase of surfactants in the, in the interface. Okay, so we applied uh, this, this model to, to a few of these systems, especially as, um, sodium dodecyl sulfate and sodium tetradecyl sulfate. No? But the only difference is that this one has two more uh, carbons in the tail. And that's the result that we see uh, the attentional modulus that grows up and then goes down. The same for this, surface tension do the behavior that I told you before. And when we apply the model, we see this, this uh, very good fit of the, of the experiment. So we can now say that the dipole-dipole interaction are the ones that should govern this, this behavior. And so um, we agreed, in summary, we agree that these, these guys are the ones to blame. And from the application of the dipole-dipole um, interactions, we can uh, fit the experimental result very well. Hilda showed you a lot, uh, some more of the, the ones that we, you, we applied. And from this work, uh, we have this one that does all the experimental things. And from the scientific reports, the one that, that Roberto told you, and the soft matter, that it is the one that that deals directly with these dipole-dipole interactions. Uh, but right now, uh, at this moment, we have submitted another one. Um, this is experimental too. And we are working in another with Roberto and something else. And well, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, we have some time, about five minutes for questions. So please, who would like to ask? <laughs> so I should be worried before that this was a very experimental talk, right? <laughs> the is the purity of, of the circular lecture. Uh, the, it's around 99%. 99. Yes. It's not very important. to have that. When you have the right molecule, it goes to the right place. So yes, yes. We were saying in that paper that this um, system could be used in uh, for drug delivery. Do you think this is true? Yeah. The application of the system is not. Um, we don't know exactly right now how to 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 apply this, but since the interfacial uh, properties are the ones that that are the remarkable ones, we may think on um, emulsions, on a stabilizer of emulsions, or maybe in, in drug delivery, uh, it has been done, as I showed you in, in it, it's actually one of the ingredients of some, um, of some drugs or as an excipient, I believe. Not like this one. 
So it is, it is a very known molecule in some fields, but the properties of, that I showed you here, um, I believe is the first time that, that were studied. If there are no more questions for the room, if perhaps if the YouTube people, the audience, anybody would like to ask? Well, then I have one question. You yes. went very quickly in yes. talking about this type of life or interaction with the doctor or the therapy. Uh, what is the magnetic of this uh, or electric type of system? Yes, electric type of system. And what's the charge? What's charge? Huh? But I mean, how the electric charge is what? Uh, how many electrons and protons you have in the dipoles? Uh, it's like a molecule. And then the other one, uh, because the, the, the dipoles are related. Really yeah. Two one complex, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, the two one complex has the. This is the surfactant. The red one is the. Is the it's oxygen. The red one is oxygen. Uh, the blue one is the oxygen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, but I will leave some uh, uh, references to some papers where if someone is interested could get details on what I am going to be saying. Uh, probably the, the, the more interesting thing in, in, in this panorama is to see how uh, different uh, models uh, are useful to understand different phenomena. Some very complex that have a lot of uh, biophysical reality and some so simple that it's just surprising how they can uh, give us some knowledge about what is happening. Uh, the main emphasis is going to be about the dynamics and the mathematical aspects of the neurons and the neural networks. Well, the, the idea of neurons, the neuron concept raised uh, uh, and it has been attributed uh, with the very good reason to Santiago Ramón y Cajal, because they, at that time, what they looked in the microscope was a, a kind of a reticula, a, a lattice that, that they considered to be a unit. So it was Ramon y Cajal who, who had the, 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 the capability of going deeper into that and, and, and propose that the convenient way to understand the nerve system is to consider these atoms these biological atoms that are the neurons. And then uh, uh, today we review this. I think all of us here are now familiar with the idea of the dendritic tree, the dendrites, the axon, and also the synapses that uh, are not welding points, but as uh, we saw this morning, a very complex uh, chemical, physical chemical process is involved here in order for the electrical signs, signs, signals to go from one neuron to the other. Uh, this is a picture of real neurons uh, made by uh, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who was it's incredible, the, the ability, not of, only of discovering the structure of, of these cells, but also to have the patience and the meticulosity of drawing them. There's a museum full of this uh, 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 picture that is worth to see. Uh, and well, you know, the, the main thing of the, these cells, the nerve cells, is that they have this electrical activity. So this is the, the, the main feature they have. And uh, this has a, a long story. Uh, starting when we, electricity was discovered, and then the first action potential, that, that's the nerve impulse, impulse that uh, electrophysiologists call them action potentials. And uh, it was uh, in 1865, when they first were uh, discovered, and uh, the, the excitability phenomenon, which is a very nonlinear phenomenon, uh, has these three main features. Uh, you see, what uh, we have is that the membrane of the cell, there is a potential difference through the, to the, through the membrane. And then if, if you, sorry, if you alter it, suppose, uh, Suppose that the, re the resting potential is minus 70 millivolts. And then if you perturb and, and you uh, remove the, per the, the stimulation, it will come back no, to the rest e e equilibrium. So it's like a classical equilibrium that we have that responds linearly coming back once you take it away from it. But there is a threshold that if you make a stimulation that crosses this threshold, then instead of coming back, it will go in the direction of the depolarization that you have created 
strongly, and then they will repolarize after a, a little while that is about the order of one millisecond. So this is the classical action potential. Uh, ah, well, and we know the, all these neurons connect themselves and the view that we have now uh, today is that, that the, the nerve system, at least one main component of the nerve system is that it is a, a very complex neural network. From the modeling point of view, the most schematic way of considering neural is what we have here. We, we know that, that the, the neuron receives a stimulation through the dendritic tree and somehow it integrates in the cellular body. And then if it uh, goes above a threshold, it will uh, uh, fire an uh, nerve impulse that uh, an action potential that will travel along the axon. It will travel, it's a very efficient way that nature have devised to do this because there is not a, a tr transport of, uh, a, of charge. Uh, the nerve uh, propagates as a wave. So there is not, uh, no, not, uh, not, um, um, uh, uh, there is, there is not, there are not charges, electrical charges moving across the axon. And then in this schema, that what we have is that we consider that there are many inputs. Uh, each input goes into the neuron uh, through a synapse. This synapse has a weight that we uh, have here as W1, W2. And, uh, and then it will integrate all this uh, information and, uh, and somehow it will have a decision function that will decide whether it will trigger an action potential or not, whether this neuron is going to be excited or not. This is the, the, the most elementary model that we have of this. Uh, here, there are something that is uh, quite interesting, and it is that if uh, some neural uh, uh, path is used frequently, it will facilitate. So in, in the model, this, this is uh, understood that these weights vary with time, uh, depending on how much they have been used. So uh, the synaptic weights will change on time. And somehow that's how we could understand how we learn because these synaptic weights are changing. If I want to learn to uh, do the serve in tennis, I have to repeat it many times, many times, many times until all these neural networks adjust the weights. And this is going to be very useful in, in terms of engineering uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, is workable from a technological point of view. Uh, we, we have here a, a little bit more of detail on the same schema. Uh, we are doing the, the, the weighted sum of all the, the signals that we have as input. And then uh, we, the, the transfer function that will decide whether the neuron will fire or not uh, could be a heavy side function or something, a sigmoidal function like, like the hyperbolic tangent that is so common. Uh, there's a point of view of mathematics. A neural network is a directed age weighted graph because if two neurons are connected well one is who is exciting uh, uh, gives us a direction and uh, there is also the possibility of not all the the connections imply a, a positive effect it, it could be an excitatory effect or an inhibitory effect that, that was something very important that was discovered actually by Sir Eccles 
And uh, but in case uh, that that the synapse is inhibitory, then the weight is going to be negative in the model. So something like this fits very well to very schematically model a neural network. Uh, from the uh, dynamical point of view, what we have then is a dynamical systems, a dynamical system that has state variables x, and uh, and have some parameters. These parameters will be the synaptic weights. If we have n neurons, then we will have a, a, a vector a, a state. Uh, for each of the neurons. Uh, imagine that probably you could, mod depends how many, uh, how many magnitudes you take in account to describe the state of, it, of each neuron. Suppose you, you have M variables, M state variables to, to characterize the state of each neuron. So this will have the complete dynamics. Uh, and, and well, this uh, vector of, uh, of weights, of synaptic weights, is convenient to understood not as a vector, but as a matrix, because then uh, W, I, J will be the connection from neuron I to neuron J. It's just a convention. So that's, that's the way. Uh, but uh, what uh, is interesting when we are model, modeling a neural network this way? Well, we want to, to, to understand what is, the dy what are, what is it, its dynamics, uh, whether it has attractors or not, what type of attractors it has, uh, in what regions, what are the regions of the, the space uh, of states, where there, is, there are the basins of attractions of each one of these attractors, because depending on where, what initial condition you get, you will get to a different attractor and you will have a different behavior. And also the, to analyze the bifurcations is very important because when you vary parameters, how the dynamics change when you vary the, the, the parameters. It's those, that's very relevant from the engineering, also from the biological point of view. So that's the typical research that you will find in this uh, uh, domain. Uh, well, nowadays we have neural networks, artificial neural networks everywhere. And they are biological inspired, no? Neuromorphic is also a term that is used very much now, and, uh, and there are different architectures of artificial neural networks that have been proved to be very useful. Uh, one of them uh, are the multi-layer perceptrons that uh, are very much like uh, the schema that today Lee May showed, no? But we have a sensory input and then we have motor output, and then we have processing inside in these intermediate layers, these hidden layers. So this is the, the flow of information goes in this direction from left to right. And then uh, we get information and then you get response. And uh, these neural networks have proved to be very useful because you can teach them to learn whatever you want. And uh, of course, you have to teach them to do something that we know, because it's going to be a supervised training. No, It's like in a school no? that uh, we need a teacher. So, but they are useful because there are things that we know to do, but we don't, we don't want to do it. We would like uh, to have some uh, machine that does it for us. And what have happened is that not only that, but they learn to do things that we know how to do it, but they learn to do it better than us and quicker than us in a more efficient way. So, uh, but there are also another type of uh, uh, architectures 
Uh, I don't have time to go to too to many, but these these are very important. Uh, these are the basis of of all the convolutional neural networks. All that we have, the deep learning neural networks, are based on that, and they have been very useful in uh, uh, image recognition in natural language processing. Now we have these LLMs, large language models, that are the basis to create these robots that has uh, surprised humanity in this moment. So uh, there are a lot having come just from, from this very simple scheme. It's surprising how, how far no? uh, 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 this uh, uh, have gone. Uh, the, the, this, this other uh, neural networks uh, are interesting because they, you don't train them. And, you know, this is the big difference between the new artificial intelligence paradigm and the paradigm that we have prior than that uh, last century, where we program things in order to create intelligent uh, uh, systems. Here, what we do is we train them, similar to what happens with us. And uh, if you want to do knowledge discovery in a database, then a, a perceptron like this is not going to be useful because you don't know what you are going to discover. So you cannot teach them to, to find the, the unknown. So this type of uh, neural networks are good because they have an input uh, neural, uh, set of neurons where you uh, input the, the data and, and there is an uh, output layer that is a planar two-dimensional layer that uh, you can use to create knowledge maps where the neural network will tell you what is the structure, how, how is uh, the organization of the data that you are studying. And uh, it, it will provide maps. These are examples of maps created by this neural network. This is actually the evolution during 30 years of the Institute of Neurobiology of our university. Uh, and, uh, and you see here a path that goes from 1997 to uh, the, I, th I think this goes until the, the 21, no, 2021 here. And, and this picture, uh, the performance profile, the, the centometric performance profile of the institute. So the, this uh, is a project that uh, Jose Luis, that is sitting here, is the leader of this uh, development of these technologies. Um, but uh, from, from what we're interested in is uh, uh, what about the physicist point of view? What is a neuron? And uh, there are just the most interesting class of uh, nonlinear oscillators that we know. They have uh, not only the capability of showing the excitable behavior, but also they could produce, uh, as we saw this morning, trains of potentials. And uh, not only that, uh, today we saw also the birds of uh, oscillations actually very complex patterns of oscillations. D different uh, neurons in different regions of the nerve system uh, produce different uh, complex patterns of oscillations that are very interesting to study and mathematically to describe. Uh, what I want to point out here is uh, how we understand all this dynamic complexity from a mathematical point of view how a mathematician could understand what is, ho what is happening. Uh, for this uh, bursting phenomena, uh, uh, I left you here this paper that I did with uh, some colleagues in the mathematics research branch of NIDDK in the, in the National Institutes of Health, 
where we did the model of the, we explained how these uh, bursts oscillations uh, uh, are happening. Uh, what are the mathematical models and, and what are the, the mathematical mechanisms that explain that? Uh, but uh, you see, I said that, that they are very interesting oscillators because they, they show self-sustained oscillations. They show these bursts of oscillation, very interesting patterns. They show also multi-stability. So the dynamical system, the differential equation has different attractors that coexist and, and, and could be, so the neuron could have something like a schizophrenic uh, behavior, no? It just a change, not in parameters, but a, a little change in, in, in initial condition could produce different behavior, completely qualitative different behaviors. And hysteresis is also, uh, which means that the irreversibility in, in the phenomena. So, and of course, it's stability. Uh, for me, it has been very interesting to find out what is the main uh, element that you need to have in a system in order to have this complex of, of behavior. And what we have found is that uh, these are the two essential elements. Uh, negative resistance that we could formulate in a very general way, not only in the electronic uh, setting, and capacitance, same, same for that. Actually, what we saw, and we were going to, to show some uh, physical models, and, and we would see that what is relevant is to have some process of accumulation and discharge. So, in, in the case of uh, neurons, the, the accumulation uh, is understood as the integration of signals in the cell body, and the discharge is going to be the fire. Uh, during the fire, the action potential, what we have actually is intense flows of ionic flows that dis discharge uh, current from the outside to the inside of the cell. Uh, okay. Uh, we saw that uh, that uh, as the system evolves, we don't see only evolution of the state variables, but also the the changes in the state variables produce changes in the synaptic weights in the parameters. So, uh, of course, the changes in the state variables of the neurons happen in a faster scale of time than the change of the synaptic weights. So the right way of uh, modeling this is to consider what is called a fast low dynamical system, where we have also a couple differential equations. We have differential equations also for the synaptic weights, but uh, there is an epsilon here because th this means that th this rate of change is small compared with the rate of change of X that we have up, uh, over here. So th these are very interesting. There is a lot of mathematical theory, qualitative theory of differential equations in order to analyze these kind of systems. And uh, we enjoy doing that. Uh, well, uh, what we are seeing is a, a very rich interplay between biology, mathematics, and engineering. So nerve cells, circuits, and mathematical models. Uh, I, I want to show you some outstanding e examples of, of this. The first one was mentioned this morning was the Hodgkin and Hosley uh, model. They won the Nobel Prize in 1963 for it. Uh, and uh, uh, what they did actually is they realized that the member cell membrane that is a, a bilipid uh, membrane has a capacitance, has also channels, ionic channels, uh, channels that have gates that are voltage dependent. So they can open and they can close in response to variation of the voltage. So to analyze how this, all these uh, things, dynamic uh, processes uh, combine to produce the nerve impulse, the action potential is what they did. And uh, for it, 
uh, the, the squid was uh, a very important individual. The squid uh, has a, a giant axon that, uh, uh, in some cases, it has one millimeter of diameter. So, so you can cut it, you can take out what is inside, you can put things inside, and you can experiment with it. But these uh, uh, squids, uh, you find it in Chile, in the Chilean coast, is where it's easy to find the, the best uh, squids. So uh, historically, uh, I, I was wondering when I was at the National Institute of Health, why Eduardo Rojas was the leader of the electrophysiologist groups there, and he was a Ch Chilean. And then I understood what happens is, is that the Europeans set up in, Ch in the coast of Chile uh, laboratories in order to fish the squids and, and do experiments. And, and this had an impact in, in science in Chile, enormous impact. Chile is, is one of the stars in Latin America doing science. Not in volume, but in quality. So he needs a monument for neuroscience, the, the, the squid. And, uh, and, and well, they found that the main, in the squid, the main two channels are uh, sodium and potassium channels. This uh, uh, uprise is due to the uh, 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 sodium channel, uh, 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 sodium ionic current getting inside. And then it goes down because there is a potassium uh, current going out. Uh, and this is because the potassium and sodium channels open when, when there is a perturbation, a threshold above threshold perturbation of the voltage. And what is wondering how nature is, uh, uh, God must be behind this, because if they would open at the same time, nothing would happen. But what happens is that the potassium channels are slower, just a millisecond slower than the sodium channels. So you have this first, and then you have the other process there. This is just wonderful. And, uh, and well, and what the Hodgkin and Huxley did, I cannot get into details, it was to create the circuit and model the circuit with a set of differential equations, four differential equations, taking uh, uh, here you have the capacitance of the membrane, you have the sodium channel and the potassium channel, and here this is an inert, uh, a, 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 they call it the leaky channel to take account other ions that are less relevant. But, but these channels open and close, so the, the, the challenge is, is to model the process of opening and closing of these channels. And the, the models of, uh, uh, this is the canonical way of uh, um, uh, models that are inspired in Hodgkin and Huxley work. And uh, you have a differential equation for the ionic channels, the applied uh, or the currents that are coming from the dendrite uh, tree. Uh, if you want to study propagation, then you have this partial derivative. And then you have a set of equations that model the dynamic of the ionic channels. Aha, en donde un PDF. Creo que pudo haber sido un calamar ofendido. Okay, entonces, this is the, the general form. The next step of modeling that is quite interesting, is a good example is the FISGU-NAGUMO model. FISGU uh, work at the National Institute of Well in the uh, Biophysics Laboratory with Kuhl, who was one great electrophysiologist also competing for the Nobel Prize, but he didn't get it. And, and uh, uh, he inspired in a previous work of Van der Poel, uh, created a model that, that explained very clearly uh, the, the mathematics of excitability. In parallel and independently, uh, Hinichi Nagumo in, uh, in, in Tokyo, in engineering, construct an electrical circuit. But when you write the equations of the circuit, you get the, 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 the equations that Fisgu uh, 
uh, uh, proposed. Uh, Fisk group, when I was at the, at the National Institute of Health, he was not already there, but he was already retired, but he would come and have lunch with us. It was just a wonderful, interesting person. Uh, and these are the equations of uh, Fisk group, and this is the circuit of uh, Nagumo. It's a simple circuit, has resistance, has an inductance, but has an, a nonlinear element here. It, it, this is a, 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 an element in which the tunnel effect that was discovered by the Nobel Prize uh, Saki physicist uh, is called the Saki diode or, uh, or, or a tunnel diode no? that has a region of negative resistance. And uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, and it has uh, as, uh, in the background this equation that is the Van der Poel equation. Van der Poel equation was historically also important. He did work also in electrical engineering. And uh, it was the first example of a differential equation that has a, a self-sustained oscillation a periodic attractor. So it's a paradigmatic example. Uh, actually, Fisgu wouldn't call his model, the Fisgu Nagumo model would say the Van der Poel von Hofer model. That's how he would uh, tell us about the model. Yes, but what is wonderful is that through a bifurcation, which you will see in a moment, you can transition from one behavior to the other. Just wait one minute. And, uh, uh, okay, and it's interesting that uh, Professor Aihara, uh, uh, today in uh, uh, Tokyo University, has as a museum the, the, the circuit of Nagumo. They, they, they conserve the, the circuit that, that Nagumo uh, had. Uh, and this is also a, a, a picture that has historical value. I think this is the first time that a, the phase space of a dynamical system model with differential equations appears in neurophysiology. This is from the paper of, of uh, Fisgu. Uh, and you see here the, 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 the experiment of excitation. Here you have the rest equilibrium of the membrane. And here you have voltage. If you perturb, you return to equilibrium. If you perturb further, you, you give a, a wider dance, but you return to equilibrium. You keep doing that. But once you go over this threshold, then you go this long trip before you come back. And that's the action potential. So this allowed us to understand very clearly how this could happen. And attending Rafa's question, uh, this is the excitable region of the system, the Fisgunagumo system. But through a parameter change, you could have also the oscillatory region. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is what is uh, understood as the Andronov Hof uh, bifurcation. That is the mathematical mechanism that displays this transition. Here is a, is a paper where, uh, with some students, with Carolina. Carolina is now a, 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 an academician at the Facultad de Medicina, no? Uh, who did work on, on this uh, in, in our laboratory. So, that was that was something that uh, people appreciated very much, Rafa. You are very very right. Uh, so we, we we went from from a system. The Hodgkin and Huxley model had four differential equations, nonlinear differential equations. We went to two differential equations that allow us to understand this mechanism. Now we are going to go to or just one differential equation. And you will see, is wondering how reducing so much, getting too much simpler, but we still be getting important and relevant knowledge.
Uh, these, uh, these are the spiking neural networks that today are very popular because, you know, all the models that are now in all these robots and all these applications are digital neurons. The state of the neuron is zero or one. No? With these models, you have a continuous a system which each neuron evolves in continuous time, more close to the real uh, nerve system. So the challenge is to see how far we can get now using more complex models of neurons in the neural networks for engineering. And uh, you, you can see if you, uh, in the Google Scholar, you put spiking neurons, uh, here you have 17,000 results, papers of people trying to understand this. I did last night, the same exercise because I did this a few months ago and I got 232,000 papers published on this. People is trying to find out how far they can go with now these richer models. And these models, how are these models? Well, these models is just a simple differential equation that actually, uh, as, as you can see here, is linear and it's subject to a jump condition. Don't worry about this, look at it in here. If you give an initial condition of this uh, differential equation, you will evolve as you see here. And what this uh, demon is doing is that once it reaches a certain value, it triggers a change of initial condition and moves you to here. And then you evolve and you come back and you come back and you come back. So you will have, you end up having south tooth oscillations uh, in uh, downstairs. And uh, uh, this appears to be very artificial, this artificial jump. And what I want to show you is that uh, this comes very natural. Historically, it has not been seen, but we have discovered that we can get there from a real physical system. Imagine that you have a, an a electrical circuit, a battery here, a resistance, a capacitor, and then you have here a, 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 a gate that could open and close, and you have a demon that will open and close. When it is closed, what uh, uh, you have is that all the charge will, uh, when it is open, the current cannot pass through here. And then the, 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 the charge has to accumulate in the capacitor. But once the demon opens the gate, the, the capacitor will discharge itself suddenly. So you will see a process of charging and then discharging, charging and discharging. So like this. Uh, it's very easy to write the equations. The equations will result is, are the ones that I show you. And this is the main thing that we have before. And uh, this will be the mathematical demon. <laughs> this will be the physical uh, demon that is open the gate, you see? But uh, uh, this is still uncomfortable because we don't like to deal with demons also. In some cases, they are interesting. In physics, we have some examples of it. The Schrodinger. Well, uh, remember that, so what I'm going to show you is how we can construct the demon in a very simple way. And for that, uh, I just want to uh, point out that this is the Saki di diode that has a negative resistance. And if you, uh, see one of these neon bulbs that we have uh, everywhere. The characteristic function, uh, this is an N shape and, and this is going to be an S shape, but also has a negative resistance. Actually, for a real uh, neon bulb, it, it, it is more acute, like it is here. And uh, with this, we can construct the demo. Very easy. You, we just put here the neon ball. We put low inductance. And then 
automatically you will get this behavior. And if you construct the, the, the circuit that we have done, you see the light uh, getting, and the frequency will depend in, in the intensity of, of the current. And if you write the differential equations, the, you have this system of uh, fast, slow differential equations no? that uh, have the same behavior. So this is very interesting thing. We still can make another step of simplification. Uh, well, here, this is the paper where we, uh, I, this work I did with Frank Hoppenfeld from the Quran Institute in New York. Uh, uh, if you're interested in, in getting more detail on this, uh, you can find it here. Uh, an interesting and difficult question is how nonlinear oscillators interact. And the simplest question is how a nonlinear oscillator, that imagine that you have here a nonlinear oscillator that has some period T0, how will we respond if you let uh, over him to have an stimulate, a periodic stimulation? Would you have a disorder response? Will you have a periodic response? If it's periodic, what period will we have? It will be T0, it will be T, it will be a combination. So this is a very interesting and difficult question to answer. And I'm going to show you a, an easy way to understand that, that will remind you with previous work that has been done in this, this institute by Rafael Perez Pascual and others. But I am going to show this from a completely different point of view, but we will reach at the end to the same bifurcation diagrams. So the generalization of the general spiking neural models, the ones that have been used, uh, is just a general differential equation that it has here u. This will be the equivalent of the voltage. You have parameters. You could think this could be synaptic weights. And then you want to have this uh, system to be non-autonomous because there is going to be external agent that uh, is going to affect it. Particularly, will be interesting what happens if, if the, this function is periodic in T. And, and then, is it, you know, this is going to be an oscillator like this. But what happens if, 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 it, uh, uh, if you have a, a different uh, periodic st uh, stimulation. The uh, pioneer work on this was done by uh, Tiner, Hobson, and Rinsels, two uh, close friends with which we have collaborated. Uh, and and they, they consider this case, the simplest case, where this is linear, as we showed before, and, and uh, a trigonometric stimulation. Then after that, uh, with uh, Miguel, uh, student of us here at the university, uh, he solved the general case where what happened doesn't matter wh which periodic function you have. And then with Fernando Ongay, that is professor of the University of the State of Mexico, uh, we solved the, the more general case of, of this. Uh, I will not, I don't want to get into the details of this, but I want to do the last simplification step. Um, but well, the summary of this 10 minutes is enough. Okay, okay. Well, I will try to finish in five. Uh, el, uh, to analyze this, what you have to do is to apply uh, the uh, Poincaré's rotation theory for dynamical systems in the circumference circle mass. No? Uh, and uh, here is the all the, all these things are, are explained. Uh, the next step is to get rid of the differential equation to have just a simple geometrical system. We had with the spiking neuron this phenomena, but what happened if we just have a, a geometric process as is shown in this figure? 
And uh, for this, uh, this is uh, uh, where I was telling you, uh, in the, these people have worked in the differential models, this in the geometrical models. Uh, Vladimir Ilyich Arnold, no? the great uh, Soviet mathematician, uh, that uh, actually they, the, the first paper in the journal Bifurcation is by Arnold, and the second paper in, in this first uh, number of the journal is by Leon Glass on what I am going to show you. Uh, and uh, there was a, a funny story because uh, Arnold was a, study, a, a student of Kolmogorov and he was studying mechanics, the KAM uh, theory, and Kolmogorov forbid to publish this and, and then later it became uh, something very relevant. Uh, what I am going to use is this idea in order to conceive this oscillator. Here you have a tank and you have water that is falling. Then when it is empty, you will have the, the, the weight wins and, and this is up. And when you have enough water, it will fall down and then you will get these salt tooth oscillations. And you have a firing sequence like this. What is interesting is that if you now alter this, actually these are using the, these oscillators with water, uh, in the Japanese gardens, in the Kill Bill pi uh, picture, there is one at, at the end of it, uh, very interesting. But if you make, the, you make the floor to be oscillating, and you make it to oscillate trigonometrically like this, then it's very easy that, that to construct the sequences, and, and you consider what you see. This could, you can imagine this to be a neuron because if you throw some water, it will go down and it will go up. But there is a threshold of water that if you throw much water than that, it will not go back, it will fall down and discharge. And then the question is, what happens if you apply a, a continuous a, a water current? So what is interesting is that if you make the elevator to uh, move this way, you get the classical family of dynamical systems, circle dynamical systems, the, the Arnold family. And, uh, and then uh, it's clear that what you have to do is, is that uh, uh, analyze the firing phase maps and use, you have this fact that it could, what you could see is that neuron is, is going to be discharging at different heights, but it could be periodically, it could be always discharging at the same height or in two heights or in three heights, in few heights, and it could make a, a sequence of Q discharges in peak periods of the elevator. So, would, which would mean a synchronization with respect to the uh, external stimulation. So this would be the QP synchrony. Uh, it's interesting, and um, uh, this is what you will have. The, the, if you have the, you have an initial condition and then this thing converts like here, you have a, a three-point attractor, no, that looks like this. And, and then you have, you, you will have a, a synchronization that the, the system will uh, discharge in three different heights. And, uh, uh, well, then we have this theorem, no? That, uh, that uh, this mechanical neuron is associated with a unique mapping of the circumference and a synchronization QP occurs only if the circle map has a periodic attractors uh, of uh, index QP. And, uh, and it's, uh, uh, this is an example where it, it have just one attractor. And uh, this is the Poincaré's theorem. It's, it's a great theorem. It says that the, if this is the function, the phase function, and if this limit exists, and if this daily limit gives you an irrational number PQ, then you will have a periodic orbit of period Q 
and uh, that will uh, go around the circumference p times. So with this, uh, the condition here is that it has to be a, a, an homeomorphism, a continuous and bijective uh, uh, function. So uh, if we remember, we had two parameters in this function that has to do with the intensity of the current and the weight, uh, the size of the weight. And uh, uh, there are some values where this function is not anymore uh, 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 an injective function. And then uh, you can calculate the regions of synchronizations that goes like this, but above this, you will have this picture that we, you, uh, I, I bet you have seen very much everywhere that gives you, us the, you see, it's very interesting because the, the, what this tell us is that if we construct this, we could see any synchronization that we can imagine, any QP synchronization that we could imagine. And not only that, what is wonderful is that you could have also the coexistence of attractors in the circumference. So you could have like, for instance, uh, uh, desynchronization and desynchronization. So it could discharge three times in two periods or four times in three periods and without changing parameters. So you, you just reset initial conditions and you could have both synchronization. It's like Mr. Hickel and Mr. Hyde uh, novels <laughs> to have the, the uh, do, uh, do behavior. Well, I think I, we could, there are many other things to do, but probably in the, in the uh, final questions. Um, uh, we want to co construct this system, we, we haven't. What we did with Carolina, the professor at the Facultad de Medicina, is that we brought the differential equations using the laws of mechanics. And uh, it's pretty consistent with the approximation that we did we did here with the uh, with the um, geometrical model, so everything fits together very well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. We have questions. Sure. So, so far, I mean, the most accurate model. Mathematical model for a neuron is the function translate, right? Nothing else. Yes. Although, for instance, you don't see bursts bursts of oscillation with Hoshi and Hoshi. That's what the work I had to do with John Rinsel at the National Institutes of Health. How do you have to enrich Hoshi and Hoxley model so you can construct networks of models such as the neuron? Also that, but, but the, the, the challenge is how just one neuron can have this verse. And, and, uh, and we have uh, realized how this can be done, not only in nerve cells, but also in the beta cells of the pancreas that has also electric activity. And they produce also, very important for the insulin uh, process, uh, they produce bursts of oscillations that uh, are very similar to the ones that uh, we see in, uh, in neurons. Yeah, the other question is, I mean, you have different types of filing and all that, and different types of neural networks. Is there any progress in the way of the output is being decoded or not? That, that's, that's a very active line of research. Uh, uh, yes, uh, not uh, uh, there is nothing great that I could tell you about that. That is uh, in my knowledge. Okay. Question: The other question is that usually you're a that the what do you think about that? Well, no, I, I think it is really functional. And, uh, and you know what is, is really surprising is that 
if you see that the action of a neural pacemaker could give such a broad spectrum of different behaviors, imagine the richness of a neural network that has 10 to the 10 neurons <laughs> that are communicating is just wonderful. But, but what is the role of face locking? I think that's, that's a very good question in, in, a, in respect to this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your. Okay. Um, you talk about uh, machine learning. So, what do you mean that and how do you think it's available to machine learning? Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Rafael, especially. For organizing this and especially inviting me. And um, during the next 30, 40 minutes, I will uh, give you a few examples of the applications of machine learning in different fields and in different, um, different systems, basically, ranging from condensed matter to material science to evolutionary biology and epidemiology. And uh, first I want to start giving uh, like a very broad concept that might be helpful for the rest. For you might be obvious, for others maybe not, which is, hmm, okay, it goes away. Okay, the manifold hypothesis, which basically states that uh, data in the, in the real world, actually in a high dimensional space, actually lives in a lower dimensional space and is intertwined in this high dimensional space. The typical example is this uh, two dimensional uh, surface, which is uh, rolled yeah, in a three dimensional space. And this idea and um, I will give an example with a very typical um, system that is used in machine learning, which is, let's imagine that we have a lot of numbers, written numbers, and we have the pictures of the written numbers. They are in black and white to make it simple. So we have a picture of n by n pixels, and we want to represent this in one uh, feature space. So the most obvious one is basically one of these numbers is one point in an n by n dimensional space. Yeah? So it's one vector in one n by n dimensional space. Now we have a, a lot of these numbers and we will have a lot of points in an n by n dimensional space. So basically the, the main goal is to find these different manifolds that we will have there. So basically all the ones will be in one place all the, and all the different numbers in different places of this n by n dimensional space. How can we visualize this, right? So the idea is to somehow uh, make a redu um, reduction, dimensional reduction of uh, of the system and see it in a lower dimensional space. For instance, if we do this for one of these uh, supervised machine learning algorithms, there's all a family, there's all a history of this method, we will find something like this. So this would be the goal to find like a map. So we see this is all the numbers here, like this is a six and so on, all the different colors are different numbers. So this is a projection from the n by n dimensional space into two dimensions. So for this, 
the, there's many ways to do this. There's all a story of uh, supervised machine learning algorithms, specifically in uh, dimensional reduction. Yes. For instance, we have uh, the most old one, which is PCA, principal component analysis, which is 120 years old. And then we have all a family of them. Yesterday, uh, John show us a lot of work done with uh, the SOM. It's a Finnish algorithm made in, uh, created in 1982 and so on. You have, this is like a very short family. There's a, there's a bunch more of algorithms. And these are the last ones, um, Disney and, uh, and UMAP, which are very uh, powerful. So it depends on what is your problem, uh, you will have to to, to choose and play with this kind of algorithms to see which one gives you more information about the system. For instance, for this case that I showed you before, these are uh, all the numbers. This is the one that I show you. Uh, this is with uh, Disney, I think. And you have all the different uh, methods and how they, uh, they do the dimensional reduction. Some are more clear than others. This one, this one, I think it's Disney. Yeah, this is Disney. I didn't do this. This is a got it from, from this paper, which is a famous paper from a few years back, which proposed this algorithm, actually, which was like the, the king for a long time. And uh, anyways, you have different results depending on what, what are you studying. So, Let's say we have a three-dimensional uh, an elephant, a mammoth, you know? and we want to see what is the projection of this in two dimensions. In this case, uh, they apply UMAP, and this is the projection in two dimensions. Um, you would say, well, what, what kind of information can I get from here, right? How can I reconstruct the elephant from two dimensions to three dimensions? It's a good question, but imagine that you have a uh, hundred dimensions or more, and you you will get a map like this, and that would be a huge amount of information about the system. You know, usually these algorithms actually work better from higher dimension than three to two to one. Three to one to two is not a good it's not a good optimization of this algorithm. It's not a good use. And here we are cheating because we are already uh, putting colors on the different parts of the yellow. So we are already pre-coloring uh, the, the different parts, right? But this is to give you an idea of what kind of map you could get of this kind of algorithms, in this case, three dimensions to two. For instance, this next one, this is a map, it's a reduction, uh, um, it's a map, a two-dimensional map of, uh, I think it's, this one is 25 dimensions into, into two, which represents each point, represent one material. And so this is thousands of material, crystal material, and you have this map. Now the point is how, what kind of future space is that used for it to this. This is a method that I proposed a few uh, years back. And just very fast from each one of these materials, this is a, we use a big data, database of electronic uh, uh, calculations, DFT calculations. This is a very massive um, database that were created long ago specifically for this, for uh, using this kind of algorithm for machine learning. Back in, 2002, they start realizing, okay, we can skip certain calculations. We have enough amount of data, okay? So here, basically I define my, let's say my number as before, by I was looking specifically to one spot of the brilliant zone of the, of the material on the electronic band. And, and I create a vector of this and basically I have N vectors, one for each one of these materials. I was looking for certain kind of uh, materials that 
that had certain properties of the on the band structure in certain point in certain part of the space. So I wanted to see the thousands of materials at once instead of looking because it's like it's not an optimal way to do. So to have a map is a huge uh, a huge help if you're looking for a spe specific properties of materials. So again, then my feature space is an n-dimensional space. It's a, so it's a d-dimensional space with as many materials as, as I use. And the point is that you can create whatever, whatever uh, feature space you want. If you look in, if you are interested in other parts of the Boulogne zone, you can define different kind of uh, feature spaces. And so you, do, you define different vectors, different spaces, and then you project them to lower dimensions and see uh, it's a way to, to, to get into, to find materials and to have a big picture of what kind of materials you have with respect with these specific uh, properties you're looking for. For instance, here are, these are different clusters. Here I use, I made uh, vectors using these two different parts of the Brillion zone. And when I look into the map and I look uh, one group of points of uh, materials, I have all together all the materials that have similar uh, band um, values in those specific places. Yeah? So if I, if I define four, I have a different future space and I have different kind of things. So, so this is another example where uh, where I use uh, we use um, a huge database. I think it's the biggest database of uh, glasses that there is. This are, is an experimental database, and it's all um, the tabulated data from the eighties. So I start playing with it to see what how can we represent this kind of information. And so I define different kind of vectors uh, using the composition and certain properties of the materials. And, and, and this is a map basically that we get. Now, why this would be useful? Again, I have a condensed uh, map with information. For instance, if I look at this, this part of this map, I will have a lot of, uh, Glasses with a specific property. And um, for instance, if you're looking for something, one particular uh, property in the glass, and you find it, then it will be very inter interesting to look at the neighbor because uh, you see this, uh, you can see a span. You can actually, in each cluster, then apply it again and find subclusters, do a PCA and then another. So you, you could have cluster inside clusters and so on. Depends on what you're looking for. So these are different different kind of uh, areas of the of the map, and different kind of properties. So, and then this is something we're doing now. We started a couple of months doing this, and uh, which is with we wanted to start from simple systems like uh, spins connected, like a Heisenberg model, uh, a chain of spins connected with uh, first neighbors and second neighbors. Probably you've seen it, it's a textbook example. You have a, a one kind of interaction uh, to the first neighbor and another kind of interaction to the second neighbor given by these two different parameters. So depending on these parameters, you will have uh, different kind of solutions. To the system. If you find a, minimize the energy, you solve this equation and you'll see you can get a book or do it yourself, and you'll see that depending on these two parameters, which are the coupling with the first and second neighbors, you have uh, different phases. For instance, antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic. Antiferromagnetic, which you have the spins in, in different orientations. Ferromagnetic, you have the spins all pointing in the same direction, but you have all a span of possibilities of this. And you have uh, these uh, other solutions, which are uh, helicoidal solutions, which you have also a lot of possibilities inside. So this is a human limits that we put, right? But 
this, uh, this is a textbook example, and we wanted to reproduce this in other way, in other words, solve the equation for many, many solutions. We don't know nothing about this, and we want to see if these methods can find the different phases of the system. And we actually, if we do this, we plot it with the two parameters, we find that the, this method actually kind of works very well. This is upside down, yeah? But it's the same idea. So all these different colors are the, the, are the helicoidal phase, which at the same time we found subclusters inside it, which are depending on the angles. And this is the ferromagnetic and the, and the antiferromagnetic. So that was a very good indication that this works very well. The next step was to, to go to the a more complicated system where, where we don't actually have the faith. Kind of getting into the unknown. I don't know why this worked before. Now it doesn't. Okay. So the idea is that uh, quasi crystals are a, a sequence of atoms, same idea, a chain of, uh, of uh, atoms with the spins that displays a um, long range um, order, but quasi crystalline order, but they don't uh, show a periodicity like in a crystalline, crystalline case. Okay. So there's way, this, this is like the simplest way to build a one chain, the Fibonacci quasi-crystal. It's the simplest way to build it. I will go very fast with this. But there's a way to do it, which is basically uh, how you, you, you start with one, uh, one atom, then you follow the, with the other one with certain rules following these Fibonacci rules. And you keep going all the way until you, you finish, finish, until you finish at the order you want. So then, again, this is a way to generate uh, a chain that displays long um, range, uh, long range order, but not but not in the crystal way. So we don't know what phase it is. We can solve the equations. We can solve the Hamiltonians. We can represent it. It's much more complicated. We can. Um, as I said, solve it, and then from the solutions, we can define a certain order, a certain parameter. This, we play with different options, but we follow this, which is basically uh, the space, the, basically. And this is the future space we build with this, uh, with this parameter. And we, we are finding all kind of exotic magnetic spaces in this. In the systems, which are we are just starting this, but usually first you start with PCA. PCA gives you a global idea, and then uh, usually doesn't get the fine details. And then you use the result of PCA into another more complex idea. In this case, we use human, and we have all kind of different uh, uh, phases that we are actually. That. But the, the point is that that is that it's interesting the fact that we we have no idea what these phases. I mean, you could you could get the thousands and thousands of solutions and start classify by hand, or do some other clustering algorithm which it didn't it didn't work. We first needed to do a, reduction, a dimensional reduction algorithm, and then a, and then a clustering solution. Actually, actually, mm -hmm. actually, we are finding cluster inside cluster. Yeah, if you, if you do PCA, for instance, oh, and you look at this, I can show you later. This. If you look at this, actually, it has a lot of structure inside this. And if you get into that, also you get a lot of things, and you, you start getting uh, clusters with UMAP in each one of the stages, and you have cluster inside the cluster, and so on. But we are we already classify like ninety percent of the of the solution. But uh, I mean, this is a very good example of something that otherwise would be almost impossible to, to, to solve. 
And after all that time sitting on the computer, you know, needed to go and play in nature. And, and this is how I met Jesse Barber, which is uh, an evolutionary biologist. He was doing his PhD in biology while I was doing mine in physics. And we would go long uh, drives to the rivers and learn a lot about evolution. Imagine the talks between both of us. No, that's my friend. That's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. Well, we are in the after afterlife. You know? And uh, Jesse, back in those days, I remember he was, um, he needed to, he had a lot of sounds. He, he used to study and he always studied mud, mud and bat and their interaction. Right? So he had a lot of uh, WAV files, you know, sound files from bats, and he needed to separate the, the and mocks too at the same time. He needed to separate the, the clicks of the moth from the bats. And I asked him, how do you do that? Well, I put an undergrad student to count them by hand. And, and, and I say, really? I mean, that guy is never gonna study biology then. And why don't you do a program? Well, none of us programs. And, know how to code. So I started you know, doing posts to do this kind of thing. And we always work together, you know, maybe every couple of years we, we get together. And anyways, he was, he called me one day and said that they've been collecting this data for 10 years. And, and they were studying, they were basically catching a moth all around the world. And uh, they will grab the moth uh, tied it to a, to a little rope and then, then put sound, bat sound to the mouth and then record the sound emitted if it uh, emits sound of the mouth. Yeah. Why they were doing this and they have a lot of data and they wanted to see a pattern to see that, that there's some mouth that respond to the bat and others they don't. Why? They didn't know. So they wanted to understand all this. The, the, basically, there's an evolutionary war between bats and a moth. You know, bats, they, they like to eat the moth. And a moth will spawn. They, they've been around for 60 million years. So it seems they found that uh, some moth, like 20%, emit sound. And it's because it's like an answer to the bat. To the bat, to the, and different kind of bat. So they wanted to classify the thing, to see from one point uh, genetically and also to see a uh, you know, phenotype. And let's start understanding of this. When, when, for instance, let's go back. Like the, this is a bat about to eat the, the moth. The bat uh, throws a sound and then uh, comes back that sound and it has a, the brain is kind of a, evolved to, to calculate the Doppler effect. And, and he could see better than us, you know, and very well what is going on. But the moth receives the sound and he hears the, the moth and, and reacts in different ways. Some, they don't react at all. Other ones, they do. And for instance, some of the math, they, when they hear the, the bat, they, they answer back with a white noise, kind of. So it jams the bat uh, radar. So when the bat actually cannot really see it, it sees a blurry thing. And uh, some other, actually, well, they see that perhaps 20% of math produce sound. And they, they are completely sure that it's because of the bats that they produce the sound. They, they develop on the, on the tree in different, different parts of the tree. They develop, they evolve different organs to emit sound, uh, which are completely unrelated. Some uh, they are on the side, some are genital, genital organs that emit sound, They're all kind of weird things. And each one has a certain pattern of sound. This is what they recorded. 
right? So they basically wanted to classify them. A lot of uh, sounds, spectrograms. So they found that at least six, six independent origins of the, of the jamming that, that I was telling before, six different um, parts of the evolutionary tree that developed the jamming. Uh, and more than 10 origins of uh, hypothesis. I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's basically uh, they warn the bat that they are not, that they are poisonous, that they are not tasty. So the, the bat eats it once, already knows that that sound is related with something they don't like, and they don't eat it. Yeah. And uh, anyways, they, they, they got all this uh, sound from all around the world. And, uh, and what we found also, and uh, this is what I found uh, studying the, their data, is that among the clusters we found of the ones that they were not tasty, there were other ones that they were actually tasty, but they were imitating the, the sound of the non tasty ones. This is mimicry. You know, it's known in butterflies. It's known in the electromagnetic world, but it, it didn't. They didn't know it existed in the ultrasound. Yeah. So basically, in each one of these cluster, for instance, I don't remember which one it was. That this is all a group of uh, moths in Ecuador, and uh, so they were all uh, not palatable, not tasty, which the bat recognizes, and some there were a few. Uh, than the word disguise. So with this, they could prove that, that mimicry actually exists in the ultrasound real. I think I, it, it was a fun work. And uh, this was published last year. And uh, they already, you know, even though it was very interesting, also posed a lot of other questions. They, they want to go back and try to get them. They asked me to go, but I said, I'm not going to go hunt. Moth, no, 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 we want you to come and brainstorm and so it might be fun too. So, all that was unsupervised machine learning. So, but the previous talk uh, gave us a very good uh, view of supervised machine learning. Typical, um, the same set of, uh, of the numbers that we had before. And you can, once you know what are the classes, you can design a, a, a neural network that classifies. So you give it, you give one number. So basically you give the vector of, of the vector, how you defined it before. And it will give, you can train this to recognize which number it is. This is a typical example, the ABC in, in neural networks. Whoever is interested in this book is online, it's, it's very, very friendly. But uh, we will make it more complicated. We, the, we will mix neural networks with differential equations. Yeah? And the, the idea of this, why would, it, would you do that? No? And uh, well, the idea is to use both things uh, to understand data, extracted a lot of data, massive data, amounts of data extracted from uh, social media the, with the goal of see if we can predict it, predict uh, the infected curve and uh, as a virus outbreak detection. But basically this data is completely noisy and it's not really related 100% with the, with the COVID, with the active uh, cases. This was uh, developed during the pandemic. And I was feeling kind of a, uh, not very useful doing quantum and stuff like that. We were in close. We had a strict quarantine in Argentina. So I started seeing what we could do. And in the States, they had a, this project that they have a lot of data, which basically were a lot of signals, uh, time, uh, time series, that they were extracted from surveys, surveys offered through Facebook. So, for instance, you have a, you have, um, I don't know how many uh, related, related COVID-related doctor visits, and uh, you can get a number from that, 
in a, in a one specific region. So you have a time series in that region. How many people you like, uh, you want, you know that have COVID symptoms in the area or COVID positive and so on. So are like early indicators or not so early indicators, but they are related somehow to how many active cases you have in the area. So the idea was to use this as a time series, as a vector, as a multivariable time series, and see if uh, you could predict. First, uh, I tried with uh, um, re recurrent neural networks and more classic ones, but made for sequences. But, but then I realized that I needed to find another way. So basically, from all that uh, huge amount of information, I chose these five signals. The new cases, this is, uh, this is really related with the COVID. This is uh, the one signal that I want to predict. Hospital admissions, this is for instance for one particular state. Hospital admissions, how many people is admitted in that time? Uh, COVID-like symptoms, how many people you know that has uh, COVID of your circle, of your net? COVID-like symptoms in the community, Okay, this is related with you, with one person. This is related with your friends. And how many COVID-related doctor visits do you have? But if you want to do a model with this, uh, a compartment model, something like that, it's really hard because you don't really know what functional... <laughs> I mean, if you, any of you wants to try, you're welcome, but I didn't know how to do it, how to relate this, all this. I know they were related, but I didn't know how. So what I, but I did know that the, the time rate of change of these signals was the interesting point. So if basically with these signals, I created one vector, right? It's a five dimensional vector in function of time. So what I'm, I'm saying, my hypothesis was that the variation, the rate of change of, uh, of that vector in time, this will give us very valuable information. But like, I didn't know the functional form of this. I said, okay, let's do this equal, this equal to certain parameterized equation, uh, function with certain parameters and see if I can fit this, uh, this parameter. To what already what I already know, which are all the signals. So a parameter, and this is a five-dimensional equation. So you could use um, a power series or something like that. But this is with many dimensions. Usually, uh, neural networks are very good. So I said, okay, I, let's equal this. Let's equal this to a neural network neural network that depends on time, on the parameters of the neural networks, and on the vector itself. And actually, this equation is, is what is proposed in one paper, a very influential paper from a couple of years back, which are called the neural ordinary differential equation. They got to here from another point of view, but basically I could use all the same machinery, machine, machinery that, uh, that they propose. So again, this is uh, the neural network and I can integrate this equation as this was any kind of function. And what I get is actually a trajectory yeah? where here I put the neural network. So I can create a solution and that's a solution in time that I can use for feeding. I can create a loss function. Yeah, for instance, this is the real data. And the red ones are solutions with the of, of these equations with the, the, the neural network with initialized with certain parameters. The idea is to choose these parameters in such a way that basically fitting this uh, green curve. So I propose this uh, simple uh, cost function. And the idea is to minimize this cost function with respect to 
the parameters of the neural Okay, so I'm trying, in a way, I'm trying to make the system to learn this curve. Hopefully, I use, uh, this is the uh, data I use until this time for the training, and the rest would be uh, the predict prediction. Hopefully, the prediction will be fine. In this case, actually, the, the center one is the one that is minimized, and it predicts relatively well until certain window. Here, it misses completely. But 20 days, depending on the state, we found that even a month and a half, it will predict it very well. Again, what I'm actually, uh, let's review, what I'm actually uh, using is the five-dimensional vector. So I'm fitting at the same time all the five signals, okay? All the way to here. And this is a prediction, but I am interested only in one of the coordinates, which is the active, uh, the active cases in the area. So again, this is a, with evaluating this, I can create a vector in function on time and I keep only the one related with the COVID cases. And then I can use it to predict. This is a pink area. I'm predicting in this way. And uh, we found that it works very well in, in a lot of different cases. And uh, this is a case of Maine. Uh, it goes all the way to 40 days, more or less. This one, uh, even, even, this was even like 90, three months. But it was not the same with all the cases. The data in each one of the of the states were different. Some were good, some were very noisy, and so on. And uh, this is Ohio, this is South Carolina. But the, there's a more general thing going on that is actually what uh, what the system is learning is that the hidden dynamical system. Okay, so this is one vector going around in time in a, in a five-dimensional space. So you can think it as a, as a phase space or, the, or coordinate space, and that you have a flow line, you know, a lot of flow lines close to the, to the one that you fit. So that would be very interesting because you could think, what happened if I do a perturbation, yeah? I would say if you had, I do a small perturbation in the vector, for instance, um, a lot of uh, active cases got into the law, into the air, and all of a sudden you have a lot of um, more sick people in that area. How this would affect? Could this model predict what would happen? That was uh, the idea, and I think it it could have it could actually work for that. This is one already trained. This is the red one that is already trained. And here we do a, a small perturbation. Yeah, in the phase space would be like jumping into one of the neighborhood lines. In here, in the case of uh, one of the coordinates, the active cases, you could see what happened if it goes up or down the number of cases. Yeah. And, um, Anyways, this is quite experimental, uh, this part specifically, but as a proof of principle, uh, it's really work. But more work is required there. So anyways, to take home, you can mix these uh, neural networks with the model. For instance, here I use only the derivative uh, the derivative of the vector in time equal to an neural network. But if you already know a lot of things about your model, you can actually, let's say you have a failure model. Yeah? And you, you can create, for instance, the one Raphael developed. Imagine that you don't know a certain term in your model, then you can put there a, a neural network and do all the same idea, but with the model. So you give a lot of structure to your system and you only put the machine learning or the neural network where 
in the part that you don't know. Okay, so instead of using the neural network like a black box, you're using already all the structure of that you already know, and you only put in the unknown parts. And uh, about the unsupervised part, the first part, the key then is the design of the future space. Depending on your problem, you, you have to play with different uh, spaces or features to see if uh, you get the information you want to extract. Um, well, hopefully I, will convince, I, I did convince you that to look into your field, what kind of information data you have and start looking at it from another perspective. There's a world to discover and, and interpret with this. I mean, it's nothing new. It's been around for like 80 years, 70 years, 80, which is nothing. But uh, I mean, it's very powerful in a lot of things and it can help a lot of discoveries. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, are there a relation between the number of parameters of the input function function uh, by the uh, the length of the prediction uh, in in the uh, of the neural OD? Yeah. We only play, I only play with the five. Uh, I chose the ones that were more similar. We didn't really uh, play with, that's the next step actually. Get more uh, information, more signals, uh, or play with different sets of signals and so on. What is hard here is the convergence of the, of the neural network. You know, the learning is, is quite a, a lot of work. And, and do you think that is more important the number of, of parameter of your input function or the number of function, uh, the, the different functions that you have? You're talking about the, 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 the architecture of the neural network? Uh, no, no the, the number of parameters for, one, for each uh, uh, input function. And um, parameters, what do you mean? Like, uh, you mean um, the time series? Yeah. You mean the different time series? How many time series? Yeah. The dimension of your vector, in so, a way? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was saying, that I only use five, which I thought they were the most important signal. But uh, we need to to change the dimension of this Y and see other options, different sets uh, of, uh, of signals. I think, is that what you asked me? Uh, yeah, um, you you say uh, some some that each of the five uh, functions uh, one uh, was for uh, uh, tests, uh, COVID tests or something like that, and the other that a uh, doctor visits uh, something like that. Here, yeah, okay. Uh, for example. Um, if, if one of these uh, functions uh, receive uh, 10 distant uh, parameters and the others, uh, other uh, 10 distant uh, parameters, 10 different parameters, yeah, these. Uh, mm, but where, where, where are the parameters you mean? Uh, the, the only parameters here are the ones, this is like a variable, this is data in a function of time that I get. The parameters we have here are the parameters of the neural network here. Here. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's um, the, the it, each function depends only of one. Uh, it's, that, it's, it's one dimensional each function. No, it's a five dimensional function no. that I have here. This this is a five-dimensional vector. Yeah, uh, but 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 each uh, function of, of input, it's it, each input is a one-dimension uh, time series. If if this one, each one of this is a one time is one time series. 
Okay. Maybe. Uh, we can talk it later if, uh, if it's not clear. Hmm? By function where? Here, you mean? Or, or, or function in here? Okay. Mm -hmm. The solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could. Yeah, I thought many times of uh, like uh, no, we didn't talk with Nadia. We talk about uh, the problem with this is that you need to be able to to minimize the cost function. You need to be able to do all the derivatives all the way of your system, the back propagation all along your system. In Python, that was harder. I did all this with Julia. It has much easier to do. All the, all the languages. I remember what we talked with Chen and all that, the automatic differentiation. And all that. But yeah, we, we can talk about that. Uh, the first question is about uh, this new algorithm, Yuma. Yuma, yeah. Yuma. Uh -huh. uh, does it have uh, parameters like Disney? Or, or yeah, Disney? yeah, it, it has parameters. I didn't want to get into that because it's a zoo. But yeah, you have parameters. Uh, compared with Disney, it goes super fast. And I think it's superior, way superior. Um, you have parameters. Uh, I don't have, a, you know, that that uh, elephant. Uh, well, depending on which parameters, you will see something or you will not see anything. Yeah. You have to play with that. It's not that you do it once. It's all like very artisanal. Okay, that's that's a difference with PCA that you don't. Well, PC, yeah, PCA is once, and you can get an analytical solution. But the point is that. Uh, most of these systems, if you use PCA, you don't get much. You use PCA ascension to, to human. Or, or you interplay between them. Okay, thank you. And the second uh, has to do with, with this uh, equation. Um, thinking that it, it must be coupled, uh, this system of, of five differential equations, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the time series uh, uh, has to have to be correlated in some way or in order to, to think that they are uh, common. Well, uh, the correlation was intuitive here. That there were, you can actually, there is, uh, there is more statistical analysis of this and uh, to see how they correlate with the people that, uh, from the university uh, that they, they were in charge of this program of data. They were more uh, statisticians. Okay. And they were doing uh, this correlations and stuff. But uh, yeah, actually I chose a couple of them because they were correlated because of their results. But others is just intuition. From all the, the set of uh, data of the variables that I have, I chose the ones that say, okay, this has sense, for instance, Hospital admissions will be related to how many cases yeah. you have in the area, and, and so on. Yeah. The five you have a bunch of other options. So whoever wants to play with this, the website is open. You can download the data. I think it's very interesting um, that you know, without knowing anything, not much, you can actually get information using this. Method. That that really matters. Yes. Yeah. 
No, what? The reason of these divergence of opinions is because we put the paper in the archive and it, ha it has already several dozen citations. So it has uh, put in, people is interested in, in this kind of method, but the referees probably belong to a field with very no, strong but, paradigm, but remember, remember that they don't admit that kind of thing. But remember the issue was more that the editor we send it to pattern and we ask for a for a fee uh, don't not to pay the five thousand dollars. Remember? I asked yeah. for that yeah. and 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 the, there were three referees, two were very very you know, nice. Very nice. And the first one was huge, like three pages and and the editor, he was, she was really she was a specialist in neural networks and and it was very interesting what she was asking, but it was two papers more. Yeah. And then we sent it to scientific reports that it takes forever. And it's it about, takes forever. Yeah, it's about to be. It is about to be accepted and not yet. So I, you, you, just to give you an impression of what, of what the shock of the community has found with this kind of report. Yeah. People in the fluid dynamics and stuff like that, they're using a lot of this and with partial differential equations and stuff like that. You can you can replace certain um, you, know, you know derivatives, second derivatives, um, and so on with a certain kind of uh, neural networks. And actually, it wasn't very well. Yeah, is is uh, there? You can ask me. Yeah, yeah. It's in Julia. Yeah, a question about if you have images, you have talked a little bit about. You have images, and you can uh, use the images with machine learning to, for example, make diagnosis. For example, an image of a red blood cell, mm -hmm. and the red blood cell is not healthy as a special shape. It would be the kind of this example, yeah. right? Yeah. You, you, it would be good first if you know the, yeah, if you know the classes even. But if you have enough data, pictures, yeah, for sure, that can be done. That's a typical, you use convolutional, you know, you have different kind of uh, this punk architectures uh, specifically for certain kind of things. Mm -hmm. For instance, the one that used uh, this first was recurrent, recurrent networks, which are for sequences. Yeah, and, and evolution. So you, you put in something, you want to predict what's what's coming next. And uh, it's good for time series. And the evolution of that are the the attention mechanism, all this neural network are used for chat GPT for text language, for language. Which is the same as sequencing. But yeah. Fishes. There's a lot of genetic uh, uh, studies with this kind of.
yeah, you play, you build your feature space and maybe then you change, you, know, you see which one is more important. Not change of subject, talking about bats. Okay. Uh, well, I really like them, but they are a bit of a pest, but you have to be very careful to protect them because they are fundamental for everything, for plants and everything. And they sold some time ago, you know, if you have seen this, like ultrasound, small devices. Mm -hmm. So the bats will not go to your garden. I mean, they will just go around oh, or they, something. Okay. And well, it's like a jam. Yeah, so I'm sure that these these studies with the with the the with sound the and yeah, the bats, yeah. yes, yes, probably yes. something like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because well, in this case, they just don't eat them. Well, the, they the, don't go away. The difference, like, yeah, the difference is here they are jamming, not uh -huh. necessarily throwing him away. Okay, okay. Know? No, the, this is throwing them away. Yeah, but protecting them because it doesn't hurt them at all. At all, they just don't like to be there. Probably some frequency that. Yes, it's nice. a frequency that is going to protect them. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're interesting creatures. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. So, Julia uh, Tawenia is in the Institute, the Instituto de Energía Renovable. And now I think uh, she's in, for a period in the Institute, the Centro de Ciencias de la Complexidad, and studying complexity. <laughs> no? Yes, something like that. Yeah, very well said. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that uh, I can explain this to everybody. The Centro de Ciencias de la Complejidad has these dual uh, possibilities. So all the researchers that collaborate with this center, we are also in other centers of the university institutions, institutes. It's not exactly that we change, but you have a dual description. So some of us here are in this. Actually, Rafael was and is in that situation. Ah, uh, you are, you are. He never goes, but he's also in this. <laughs> she will talk about sustainability for complex system research on eco technology. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, let me start by thanking Rafael for inviting me to be here. I'm really enjoying very much this symposium. And I'm really realizing something I knew already, that Rafael is a big hub, but he has a very interesting network. I am just glad to be part of this network. So thank you so much for this invitation. And let me, let me tell you something just to start. Uh, I define this work as, uh, um, I put this definition, no? the sustainable development goals, you know, they were defined in 2015 by United <laughs> Nations. All countries in the world, including Mexico, signed this agreement. And of course, what we want to do is study this sustainability as a complex system where we mix society, economics, environment, and institutional aspects. And well, as I'm going to, I'm going to present you the first step of this, what we consider a big project. But I should have changed this if I have heard Kimo before because what I'm gonna show is a statistical approach, <laughs> a bunch of data that will lead us to something more fundamental. And we are in this, in this first stage, okay? And well, it was fantastic for me that I'm talking about after Umberto and after Matias, because you have already presented the knowledge maps and some sort of results that I'm gonna present to you now in the case of sustainability. So just to remind you, these are the sustainable development goals. There are 17. I like to say that uh, they come from a real discussion because otherwise there will be 10. Whenever you invent something, you use 
10 or multiples of 10, but being 17 means that it, they were really argued by everybody around the world. There were many organizations and countries discussing which should be the development goals. I'm gonna talk about them in uh, already starting this idea of complexity. Uh, using this, this work by a group in China that is studying how sustainability is related to complexity. And what they, what they address in their paper is that sustainable development where it's a product of society, which of course, and it, it has really um, balance between human development and environmental uh, protection. And they divide the 17 goals in three categories, essential needs, expected objectives, and governance. And I'm gonna talk to you a bit about these three categories because what we are trying to do is understanding how the goals relate among each other and how they can be put together looking for a policy for, for, develop, for sustainable development. And well, you will see that of course, it depends on science and technology, but also depends on social science and ethics and also on policies. It's, it's important to mention that we don't have the difference as in English between politics and policy. We have only one word for both of them. And I will always talk about policies, not politics. So how we should present our development in order to achieve a certain goal. Okay, and uh, uh, they, they also use this network approach. So let me, let me just mention which would be the essential goals. Well, the minimum. If you don't have food, water, energy, the oceans and the ecosystem, the, the land, the terrestrial ecosystem, well, there is no life. So they are absolutely essential goals. And they are mostly related to natural science and technology, mostly because everything is multidimensional and multi uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Uh, then you have what they call the maximum realization because you don't only want to live, you don't want only to survive, but you would like to have a better life. So you don't want to be poor, you want to be healthy, you want to have access to education, you want a world with gender equity, economics and liberal rights, equality, safe society. And they call this maximum realization and they are mostly related to social sciences and ethics. And then of course, there must be some institutional putting together of the goals. And that is what they call governance. And you have the infrastructure, the urbanization, how you buy the consumption, uh, the climate, the global partnership. And that has to do with science policy, with policies in general and with inter interdisciplinarity. Um, now, what I'm gonna tell you is about a work that we have just finished and we are going to send now for publication. And these are the, the collaborators, Ricardo Ruiz, Ricardo Arencivia, Jose Luis Jimenez and Humberto Carrillo. They are all, Carrillo, they are all present. So I'm gonna share with them the honor and the questions. If you ask something that I think that they should answer, I will pass them the question in a very elegant way. Um, eh, Ricardo Ruiz, is a postdoc in the Center of Science, Complexity, Ciencias de la Complejidad, and he is from, from Chiapas. And we were looking for something related to renewable energies and for Chiapas, for our state uh, in the South of Mexico, ecotechnologies is a very important subject. And that's the reason why we chose in particular, of course, energy is under all the development goals. There is no, goal for sustainable development that is not depending on energy. And we chose the eco-technology because we thought it was something that is going to be interesting for Ricardo when he goes back to work in his state. Um, so what we did, we started with a biometric study of research on eco-technologies. And uh, uh, we followed the evolution of scientific production considering the web of science, as well as the citations. And then, there was a neural network based approach that was used to perform a multidimensional analysis. We would, I will show you the knowledge maps that were obtained in a very well, it was so well explained by Matthias that I won't have to explain it again. In our case, the, the dimensions, the indices that we are taking into account 
is the ratio of the ecotechnology production over the national output, the normalized impact of research, the proportion of international collaboration, the GDP per capita, the research and development expenditures, and the national proportion of renewable energy consumption. Because we wanted to see which were the countries that were more interested in these sort of subjects in these sort of uh, studies. And then we also wanted to see which were the main technological solutions. So in the same way that we study the countries, we study the subjects, the topics. So let's say we, have, we found two sorts of knowledge maps, knowledge maps about the countries and knowledge maps about the themes under the eco-technological, the, eco the eco technologies. Um, okay. And finally, I will show you how research on ecotechnology has been impacting the sustainable development goals. Because at the end, what we want is to relate all this information to the sustainable development. Okay, so let me just start defining ecotechnology. Ecotechnology is also called green technology. It's also called eco-innovation. And it's a multidisciplinary approach that aims to develop sustainable technologies to reduce the environmental impact of human activities. It's of course a multidisciplinary for, uh, field, has to do with ecology, biology, chemistry, engineering, um, in, and the idea is to minimize pollution, conserve natural resources, enhance ecosystem system, eco, eh, sorry, ecosystem services. But of course, we have to admit that there is no free lunch. I mean, any solution as a price. And we talk about clean energies, but where they are clean in a certain, certain way. I mean, they are not producing CO2, but so you have to be very careful in this balance. We were talking about this at lunchtime with Timo. You have to be very careful in how you balance what you, how you contaminate and how you sort of control this contamination because at the end you, you are trying to balance, but you always affect in somehow, in some way. Okay, but the goal, the final goal, is what is called a circular economy, because what you want is there is always waste, but you want to minimize this waste, and you want also to maximize efficiency, and of course you want to preserve the, the planet, because this is the only house we have, and as you know, good planets are difficult to find. Okay, so which are the questions that we are going to address? First of all, how much research has been carried out by academic and scientific institutions? What characteristics do these investigations have, which are the subjects which are more relevant? Which countries have led the research? What have been the main topics and research fronts analyzed by the scientific literature? How have the research results impacted the sustainable development goals? We were based in this paper that I'm putting here, which is a very good um, description on how ecotechnology can be used in the research literature. So we are using their proposal on how to classify ecotechnologies. And well, I told you this already, this is used, ecotechnology is used to describe a wide variety of practices and technologies which include renewable energies, waste management, water treatment, we actually will uh, tell you something that I would repeat later on, but water is a very, very fundamental subject. And water treatment is probably the one that we found the most in all this uh, study of the literature. And we have to admit that even it sounds very natural how to describe ecotechnology, there is still, um, there is a lack of a clear definition. And there are, also, there, are, there are also fashions. Some technologies are calling away in a certain span of time and then they change the name. So of course, whenever you study something like this, you will be missing some of the information is inevitable. Now, I won't read you this, this slide. It's all the materials and the method and here you see in how we use, we have been talking about this already. And uh, these are the, the information that we'll get. We are using the web of science. 
um, as a source of data. Uh, we are considering all the citation indices by the core collection that we have in, the, in our university. Uh, the science citation index expanded, the social science citation index, arts and humanities. Well, I won't read you this, but these are all the, the information we are using. And also we use a, um, a, a method that probably you know that is called insight. And we were very, very thankful to Clarivate because they gave us a free license to use it. Uh, the university hasn't still got the license, we hope they will. But in this uh, process of convincing them that insight is a very good way to analyze results and data and productivity, we were able to use the, this program for a certain number of weeks. Okay, now which are the, the, the indicators that we were using? Well, we, using, we were using the category normalized citation impact, CNCI. Of course, we, are also, we were also interested in see how the, which was the impact factor of the journals used to publish on eco technology. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Then uh, we noticed the following. We noticed we were looking also for the international collaboration. And uh, we also wanted to see which were the countries that had the highest scientific production in these subjects, okay? So those were the indicators that we were using. And then we, follow, we found, we used the, the method that has been mentioned here a few times already. Thank you, Matias, for explaining it again, this sum. Uh, Jose Luis will talk about this in his talk tomorrow. He will mention it in this talk tomorrow. And as Humberto mentioned, this method has been used in the nonlinear dynamic laboratory of human. So we were using a method that has been used in the last uh, period of time and is going developing and getting more, um, well, more applications, more examples where this can be applied. Okay. So which, which was the data that we, we study? There were 695 documents um, identified in the core collection of the Web of Science. 652 were published until 2022. Uh, these uh, research papers were edited by 173 publishing houses, covered by 127 subject categories, and of course, the major publishing houses, Elsevier, Springer, Nike, Taylor and Francis, and most these, these very important publishing houses cover the 52.4% of the papers. And then the subjects, as I mentioned already, are environmental sciences, engineering, environmental and ecology. They were about the 43.4 research. And well, what I want to, what I want to mention is that there, there were a lot of papers um, that have been getting more and more citation each time. There is at least one citation for almost 500 of these papers, and there is clearly an exponential growth on the interest in this subject. So we have this in this plot. You can see how the, the number of papers from 93 to 2022 has increased exponentially, and not only the papers, but also the citations to the papers. Okay, so uh, um, this is a summary of uh, the papers we use. Uh, I don't want to repeat every detail, but I just want to show you how the details are included in the work, because as Pino said, we have to put a lot of data together and then from there, get a model and understanding something which is more fundamental. So um, in, there was only one conference proceeding. We give the detail here and all the journals with it. Let, let me tell you that we were, uh, there were not so many, as I put here, only 15 series were published covering only 
23.7% of the scientific production. Not the most important journals have these sort of papers. Okay? They are developing more and more. They are growing in an exponential way. But clearly, they are not the hottest issue in ecology, in uh, energy, energy renewable, renewable energies and sustainable development. OK, so as a summary, we have that 30.5% are in journals Q1, 33.7 in Q2, 18.6 in Q3, and 70.25 in Q4. But only 9% of the articles were ranked in the top 10% and top 1%. This is the top 10% and the top 1%. So ecotechnology is a topic that is not, it doesn't have a high visibility in the mainstream literature. I mean, it's a subject that is, is not considered as so important. Uh, and only 27% were published in open access, and that limits the viability, which is a bit surprising because the idea of ecotechnology is to make it very popular among a lot of people. Now, let's see the geographical distribution. Let me just get a bit of water. Okay, so um, we were interested in seeing which are the countries that think that ecotechnology is a good solution in the search of sustainable development. And uh, There were 75 countries involved. China got 81 paper and is the leader, followed by United States, 62, India, 44, Germany, 40, Japan, 29. There are four developing countries included in the top 10 of the ranking. And it is important for us that one of these countries is Mexico. So China, India, Mexico, and Brazil, Mexico with 4.4% are included in the top 10 countries that publish ecotechnology. Okay, so it seems clear the importance of these of this, uh, uh, sort of technologies in countries as China, India, Mexico, and Brazil. Okay. Um, However, if we included in the analysis the ratio of the ecotechnology production over the national output, then the landscape changed. I mean, China, use, uh, USA, and India led the countries with number of, of documents, but once you normalize, considering the national output, it turns out that the countries that give more importance to ecotechnologies are Latvia, Ghana, Estonia, Morocco, Bulgaria, Nigeria, Mexico, and Vietnam. Okay, so what we think, and this is something that we imagine, I mean, there is not a surprise, is that countries that are in a developing process, developing countries with more problems, with less, um, modern technology perhaps, or where there are many isolated places that you have to find local solutions for them, are the ones that are favoring ecotechnology. Even that the absolute numbers seem to indicate something different. But once you normalize and you analyze deeper, then you see that the countries that are um, more interested are Others are the ones which are developing countries. And this can be shown in this plot where you can see the geographical distribution of the scientific production of ecotechnology. This is one of the things that insights can do. And um, of course, it is based again in the world of science. And this information leads, sorry, to a knowledge map. 
that has been very well explained by Natias just a moment ago. And Umberto showed the same sort of representation for the study they did on the Neurobiology Institute of Unam. So you can see here clusters, C1, C2, etc. And you can see the countries included there, like Latvia. This cluster is the one, well, more relevant for us, for us, at least the Mexicans in the room, which has Brazil, Colombia, Romania, Mexico, and Bulgaria. These are the countries which have similar indicators. And also, look here, Nigeria and Ghana. It seems that like this line, we have things in common, and we are facing the study of uh, the ecotechnology in a similar way. And this knowledge map can be taken further, and you can see how these countries have these multidimensional profiles. And again, here, for instance, you have the national share here, and this is the category normalization by citation impact. So you can see how, for instance, this one is very relevant because GDP per capita puts all this part of the knowledge gap in the country, in the region that our country is, while this extreme, although they produce in airport technology, they are not using it very much because they don't need it so much. That's, it's very clear. Ecotechnology also is a very local solution in particular places. And in many countries, they don't need that, but others, as we, are, as we do, need it. For instance, this one is also a very important analysis, the renewable energy consumption. How um, it's interesting how these countries are using um, renewable energies and research and development expenditure. That is very sad because it means that we are not using enough money dedicated to science and technology, contrary to this side of the knowledge map that is investing in science and technology. So, as Matthias just said, this sort of analysis gives you a very precise. I think that is an example showing, following what you said, or how a knowledge map can give you immediately, graphically, the situation, how it is. This is about countries. Um, here I'm just um, insisting in that C1, C4, and C6 have a very similar situation. Uh, for instance, um, um, here uh, we have the um, we have uh, the consumption of renewable energies and spe specialization is similar in all these cases. Um, Mexico was the most productive country in the group, with stable activities since 1990, 1990, 1990 and um, a big thematic diversity. We'll go back to that because the next knowledge map that I'm going to show you is about the thematic clusters. Um, so, um, well, the note that Latvia and Nigeria and Ghana are similar to our cluster for. Now, the same sort of analysis was done for the thematic domains. And again, it has to be done in a very similar way. There, is a, there are macro, meso, and micro topics. And this has been implemented by the web of science. So we are using the web of science. And um, so we, we took 10 macro topics, 100 mesotopics, and 188 microtopics. And with this information, we build the knowledge maps of the, the thematic surrounded ecotechnologies. Here, I, I, I don't pretend that you read this. These are all the different uh, macro, meso, and microtopics that were considered for doing, for studying the thematic relation. And uh, the color scale represents um, the percentage of papers in Q1, the normalized impact of research. And well, it's just a very graphic way to show that there are many, many topics and they are related with different, they have different uh, weights. And with this uh, information, then again, a cluster, uh, knowledge map can be built 
this time is not in this square fashion, it's built in a different way, but again, the, uh, each number is the topic. For instance, number one is the wastewater treatment that is constructed with wetlands and general issues. Number two, ecological engineering and environment management. Number three, large scale wastewater treatment, et cetera. Um, and of course, the size of the bubble depends on the number of papers in the topic. And also the distribution shows topics which are less related. For instance, this 16, 16 is licensing strategies. I mean, it's important, but it's not exactly in the core of what the research is being done in ecotechnology. While these, all these ones are together, number 12, for instance, is um, recycling aqua aquatic and animal waste uh, using larva and algae. Actually, most of these numbers in the center have to do with water, which of course is probably the main issue related to ecotechnology. So, um, once we have done this thematic analysis, the next thing to understand is how the subjects are related to the sustainable development goals. Because we want to know which are the sustainable goals that are being you know, addressed in these in this, uh, papers. This is something that is also done in, in the programs that were used. And uh, for instance, a, a, we have here the sustainable development goal number three, which is health. And there were 64 papers related to that. And the same thing was analyzed for each one of the sustainable development goals. And of course, we, we still have to go deeper into this information, but I just remind you that uh, they have not the same level of, of relation to society. They are the essentials, they are the quality, they are the institutional. And it, it's gonna be very interesting how these uh, studies impact certain sustainable development goals. Mostly, let me tell you, the essentials. Because for instance, the institutional ones are not very well attended by these technologies that are a bit, they, they don't correspond to a big national program, for instance. There are more solutions in different towns, in different places of the country. So we don't see this international, this um, uh, sort of uh, institutional collaboration. We don't see either a lot of international relation because they are, they are so dependent on the country. Uh, for instance, there are certain problems with water that have to do completely with the weather, with where the country is, with, and they will never have the same problem in a country that is really cold in the winter. So there are so many local differences. So the institutional part is not very well described here. Well, it's not included here in a way. But for instance, um, in sustainable cities and communities, there, there are quite a few because each time there are more uh, small solutions in communities, in cities. For instance, people put in their terrace, in their gardens, they create there an organic garden and they attend there. It's, it's one of the eco-technologies and they attend this problem they have in their houses. So as you can see, all these uh, goals were analyzed. And of course, again, the size of the bubble means that how many papers were related to the goal. And well, let me see, um, well, um, I, I made a summary that I will show you now. But for instance, um, the clusters with the largest number of article impacts on water and clean water is cluster eight. Underwater life is cluster seven, which are the thematic clusters. I'm talking now the thematic, thematic clusters. And again, we confirm that water and wastewater is the most relevant topic of all the things we analyzed. Um, research impacting on life and land and climate. Uh, they are both located in cluster three. Um, of course, again, 
things that have to do, programs that have to do with CO2 emission and control and climate change uh, mitigate, mitigation. Uh, for instance, a cluster nine compromises uh, 113 articles which are related to sustainable cities. I, I already mentioned that one. And well, it's really interesting. We have seen here very interesting um, results, which sometimes they do surprise us. There are some things we were expecting, but there are some surprises as well. But for instance, uh, if you cover the number eight, which has to do with work and economic worth, then uh, it has to do with agronomy, biodiversity, conservation, management, material science, etc. cetera. Mm, okay. Um, I don't want to go through, through all the details, but uh, I just want to go to number close to 10, because he's what my, he's what my institute does. It's uh, sustainable development goal number seven, which is affordable and clean energy. So I think that I should mention that. It is included in many of the papers because I am convinced that renewable energy is underneath all the solutions that we are trying to find in these sustainable development goals. Um, okay, so just as a summary, 11 of the 17, especially this one, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, can be used as markers of environmental or social impact. Um, number 16 and 17, which is the search for a peaceful society and the alliances, we didn't find any paper related to these two subjects, which I think is also relevant to, to mention. Um, of course, this work is useful to understand how research on ecotechnologies can contribute to the sustainable develop, development goals. Um, also how uh, this sort of technology goes through different disciplines and through different scientific journals. And our goal is that it can help policies can help decision makers, researchers, and stakeholders to identify areas where there is a possibility and where um, there is a way to achieve the sustainable development goals. Of course, this is a very complex relation, has many uh, dimensions, and well, it is influenced by so social, uh, political and economical factors. Which are the limitations of our work? Well, uh, first of all, let me tell you that we were looking for the syntaxis ecotech. So if this is not included in the title, in the abstract or in the keywords, perhaps we are missing the paper. Another limitation is that we are just using web of science and insights. So well, again, we are limited to this search of information. But well, what is, what is interesting is the present study, perhaps it does not provide a detailed analysis, um, but we think that we at least understand uh, which is the state of art of ecotechnology research. And we have seen this from a multidimensional perspective. And of course, to model this would be the next step. But let me go then to the conclusions. Um, we have noticed that in ecotechnology, there is a low presence in highly cited journals. Although the publication has increased, they are not choosing the highly cited journals. And also it has to do with the fact that is not considered a um, trend topic in the countries that produce most of the research. Um, the low citation index, uh, the low citation rate of ecotechnology research, maybe is that it's still an emerging field because all these studies, many of them are very recent and it's very recent also this uh, real worry about the climate change. So all this is happening in this moment and maybe that is why this is still developing. 
Um, we think that uh, there will be an increase in the normalized impact. And uh, at the moment, there is more specialization of research observed in low income countries. And complexity of the process of analysis and evaluation of the scientific production in the technology and uh, the relation to the social impact and the sustainable development, development goals. Think, we think that this, uh, the analysis of this, this complexity will give information that might be very useful to find a way, well, to find a way survival because that I really see it in, in that way. And uh, um, let's hope that in the next symposium, Rafael will invite us again, and then we will present the model. <laughs> that we put. <laughs> and uh, uh, just something else that I would like to say is that um, all the group that we have been working with is, we have also been working in another project involving Rafael, and Kimo, and Alberto, and Cite, who is over there. And we have enjoyed very much the group, we have been working on how the, well, actually Umberto mentioned something like that because that's what he ha they have done in the Neurobiology Institute, how the academic organization produces a different productivity, how the productivity of an institute, institution, of an academic institution depends on the, um, on the um, organization, of the internal organization. And we have been discussing this by Zoom. And we have been discussing this at least a year, right? By Zoom. So it is absolutely fantastic to see you all in person. Um, the story also highlights the importance of effective white, uh, wastewater, how it's also very important uh, restoring degraded ecosystem. And well, we hope that this resource contribute to the information provided for researchers, policymakers, and society in general about the importance of ecotechnology research and its potential impact on solving global, environmental, and socioeconomic challenges. So, thank you very much. Question. I think this is a rapidly evolving field, particularly the worries about climate change and the environmental protection, lack of water, as you mentioned that, and uh, sources of renewable energy. And I think that panorama will change very rapidly because of the new technologies like water desalinization. Uh, why don't we use that, which is a natural thing to do, extract water from the ocean, is because the energy I hope to put in is, is comparable with the energy you, 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 you want to extract. And also with a, a fusion uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. But I think, I hope that I live long enough to see developments in both. So people stop talking all day about <laughs> lack of water and no, lack well, of energy. Yeah, well, um, I agree with, with you that uh, I am convinced that it's in science and technology where we should struggle to find solutions. But the problem, the problem can be very local. It's not the same situation uh, in the Tarahumara that in the coast of Veracruz. So you have to be thinking in different possible solutions according to where the community is, is living. And also we have very isolated communities and we have to take the energy there and we will never, the, the normal electricity will never reach them. You have to find a different way to reach them. And something else which I think is really relevant and important is that you cannot criticize um, a community that is cutting the trees to cook because they don't have any other source of energy. On the contrary, what you have to do is to take to the community solar cookers 
so they don't have to cut the trees. So um, it's a very complex problem. It involves many parameters, but the idea is to find a combination of many solutions. That's what I'm trying to say. There is not just one solution. There are many solutions combined, and that's the way I think to go. But what I what I found really interesting in this in this research is that now we know which are the subjects that are being the most studied, and also the results. Because imagine that we want to establish a solution. So there is water. I don't know where. Awesome. We have the reference. We can use the microbes. microbes. We can use their different techniques, which are already being very successful. So, uh, in a way, I think this is very hopeful that uh, there are being uh, solutions studied and trying to. We are trying to solve real issues on the normal life of people. <laughs> well, well, um, well. To discuss AI is, is quite a subject. Uh, I am sure that AI has here to stay, so we better know how to handle it, and we start learning how to handle it. What worries me about about AI is that as it's learning from us, and we are very bad teachers. So there is a big problem of, on ethics. And there have been quite a few, there is now a document by UNESCO on the ethics of AI, and particularly on, on gender issues, because if I imagine people training AI to be as, you know, as macho, as terrible as, as we know there are so many. So um, AI is here to stay but I think that there is a big issue on the ethics, on how it's used and how it's implemented. Yes, I just want to do a, a comment on what Julia has uh, told us. I think that the, the uh, interesting uh, thing that uh, something was, was interesting for me here is how uh, measuring the, the 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 proportion of uh, research that is devoted to this subject that is so relevant for all the world, we see that the the, the highest uh, proportion of the research of the countries is in the uh, low economy countries, uh, which are the in, uh, that have the, the higher needs. But the less resources, so and and the richer countries uh, are devoting a small proportion of all the capabilities of research for this very relevant subject. So uh, we, as a world, are not paying the the right attention to something. Yeah, that could that be is one of very the, relevant. That could be one conclusion I didn't put, but yes, I agree. For me, it's strange that uh, in your study, you don't say too much about renewable energy, like photovoltaic. Because the uh, eco technology is not photovoltaic. Photovoltaic, which is the best possible solution, actually, I work in photovoltaics and it's a mature technology, it's cheaper, it's the cheapest way to have electricity and is the way to go, is not eco technology. Why not? Because eco because technology are really. Let me put it, I don't want to be pejorative, but it's low scientific technology. Yeah, there are technologies which are uh, related to local solutions, not to put an aero uh, generator or to put a field of uh, solar cells, which is certainly the way to go. No, no, that's the way to go, but they are not classified as eco technologies. Eco technologies are something different. Of course, the solution are solar cells. I mean, you, you don't have to, I am completely positive of that. There is absolutely no that. I mean, this is not a study on renewable energies. It's a study on eco technologies, which is absolutely not the same. Actually, some part of the eco technologies 
are renewable energies. Others are mostly chemistry, chemical solutions on how to um, clean water, or they are not even classified as renewable energies. So this is ecotechnology, is a special field of research, mostly done on journals on um, ecological engineering, uh, is is not a renewable energy um, field. It's part. There is an overlap. But, but if you will allow me to say, I am convinced that photovoltaics is the way to go. In this moment, photovoltaics is already the cheapest way to produce energy, electric energy. Actually, there is. Um, if you allow me to give an. Um, a sort of advertisement, there is a there is IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy Agency, where Mexico is also a member, and they put all the um, they put all the prices of how electricity is produced in the world because of course in an energy basis electricity is what everybody wants. I mean that's the bottom line. You want to have electricity for your cellular force even if for nothing, nothing else. So IRENA is publishing all the prices of all the, and it's amazing how solar cells have been, you know, becoming. And also the, um, the wind energy, the wind energy is also developing. And something really interesting, and that will change probably also the, this local problem that I mentioned, they are producing small wind generators so you can have a small one in the community. You don't have to have a huge field. And of course you can have solar cells on your ceiling, which I have. Of course I have in the ceiling of my house, solar cells, they wouldn't be consistent if I don't do it. But ecotechnology has nothing to do with photovoltaics. Well, not nothing to do, but it's not photovoltaics. It's not photovoltaics. Photovoltaics is in, not, in another classification, okay? Well, I'm, I'm quite surprised that it's not uh, considered ecotechnology. Anyway, renewable technology, I, I tell what has happened in Finland uh, in terms of a renewable energy. Uh, let, let's say uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was considered ridiculous to put up uh, uh, these photovoltaic uh, or solar panels uh, to, the, to the houses. Nowadays, there is a big pool. Well, why, why it was considered ridiculous is that the uh, sun doesn't shine that much uh, in, the, in, in winter time in, in the Nordic latitudes, mm -hmm. and, uh, perhaps uh, three to four months. But nowadays, even uh, people put uh, these uh, uh, solar panels uh, mm -hmm. to their summer cottages. And I'm also considering to do that. OK, yes. do it. No, do it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Actually, and my... also, also this uh, uh, there's a lot of boom in in terms of wind power. Of course, they are making the uh, these uh, big farms of uh, windmills, uh, uh, and that is uh, also for the reason that it could be uh, to produce uh, 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 hydrogen technology. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. As, yeah, no. Well, let me tell you that there is a huge program now in Mexico to do a, a enormous field of solar cells in Sonora, because we have this land in the desert that we can use. Because some countries they don't have so much land to use it in there, so there is this very big program to make this this solar cell field, and certainly it's going to be really very important. But you see, the point is that if you do a huge solar field, solar cell field, you have to work on the transmission lines. And transmission lines are quite a problem. Actually, in Mexico, there is a huge problem with the transmission. A lot of energy is lost in the transmission because of poor quality. So we are looking very much for local solutions. So you put solar cells on the top of your house. But you don't put a field close because then you would have to have a transmission line to be close to it. Okay. So all this, and also I don't know if in Finland they are using batteries because once you have the solar cell, because the, the way I have the solar cells in my house, and we put it more than 10 years ago, 
is because you can make, uh, um, you can change your, when you have light in your house, you change the, the agreement, and then you are also giving light to the normal transmission. So your, your solar cells are giving energy during the day, and during the night, you are taking energy. In general, you give more than you take, but the, 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 the state, they don't pay for it. I mean, they, you just almost don't have to pay anything. You just pay the, to be connected to the line. But if you gave more than you use, they won't pay. But this has been working in Mexico for a long time. When we put it, uh, solar cells were quite expensive, not anymore. Now to put them is completely affordable. So in Spain, for example, we have many days. The price of energy is zero because Ah, yeah. oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I, I'm glad you told me that because I think we have to explain better in the paper what is eco technology. Okay. You talk about eco technology from the point of view of published scientific paper. Mm -hmm which uh, probably doesn't reflect reality very much. Absolutely, yes. So you could do the same kind of a study by uh, enterprises or industry that actually produces these eco-technology objects. Yes, uh, many of these eco-technology objects are locally produced because they can be locally produced because they are very, it's a, it's a technology that can be produced in the community. But I agree absolutely with you because there are programs in Mexico, which are not university programs, that they are taking eco technologies all around the country, and you can look for that instead. Yes, but yes, but we wanted to make a knowledge map, <laughs> and we need it. We need. But I agree with you because being eco technology is something that you can address locally. It does is not necessarily in a scientific paper. It can be perfectly well. In a, for instance, there are many young people in Mexico doing this. They go to the communities and they build things there. Mm -hmm. That sort of information would, should be very relevant. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, then let's stop. Yeah. Muy buena, Natalia. No, un comentario. Hablando de esto de. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one question I have. Yes. No, a comment. Talking about this AI and all this, I think it would be very interesting to, you know, you can train a language model and make it a, a specialized in something, which is one of the interesting things about this model. So you could actually get each one of the clusters and you know, train one model in those. Uh, Specific scientific papers. Okay. And then you could ask, you know, it would be, they're very good for what I've been playing with and what I've been working with them to relate to this. Uh -huh. So you can ask things and you, know, you can get completely you know, new ideas that they're not creating, they're just uh, putting together. Yeah. Putting together. Yeah. Uh, it's just a comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good idea. Okay, well then, thanks for all the speakers. Um,